It's time for Twig this week at Google. Jeff Jarvis is here. Stacy Higginbotham. Aunt Pruitt has the week off. But sitting in his seat, we've got Sam Lesson. You may remember last week we were talking about Sam's plan with his venture capital firm to invest in creators. Sam will explain more. We'll also have the Google change log and the usual fun. We're even going to talk about a new Pokemon Go style game from Niantic that lets you hunt for Bitcoin. It's all coming up next on Twig. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is Twig. This Week in Google, episode 639. Recorded Wednesday, November 24th, 2021. The Turducken of Cakes. This Week in Google is brought to you by Akamai. Akamai powers and protects life online and is changing how we live, work, and play. See how Akamai is unleashing the Internet of Possibilities for the biggest brands in the world. Visit akamai.com slash twig today to learn more. And by userway.org. Userway ensures your website is accessible, ADA compliant, and helps your business avoid accessibility-related lawsuits. The perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the law. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off Userway's AI-powered accessibility solution. And by Andela. Andela is a global talent network connecting innovative companies like yours with quality technical talent so you have more time to focus on your core business. Visit andela.com slash four dash companies to schedule a complimentary consultation and receive a two-week no-risk trial with their vetted technical talent. It's time for our Twig this week in Google Show. We cover the latest news from the Googleverse, the Twitterverse, the Facebook verse, the media verse, any verse you have in mind. <laughs> Stacy Higginbotham is here. Stacy on IOT.com preparing. She's already behind, she says, for Thanksgiving. Already. Yes. Already behind. My turkey my my chicken is not in its brine yet, and the cranberries haven't oh, been cooked. You might I oh. give you I give you dispensation to run and put that turkey in the salt. Well, it's not it's not a turkey, it's a chicken. So I, oh, as long okay. as it's overnight, Won't it's technically fine. Won't take as long, yeah. Yeah, you you were the one who a couple of years ago showed us your Gantt chart for Oh, the Gantt chart is essential. When you're hosting Thanksgiving for 12 and I will tell you all my food comes out exactly on time and hot I actually, thanks to the Gantt chart. I copied you because of that and I do a Gantt chart now too. I even put it on the refrigerator. What, what else? Very old school. I assume you'd scrum it. <laughs> Scrum it. <laughs> Already getting plugs in for his investments. We're going to get to him in just a second. But first, Jeff Jarvis, Professor Leonard Tao, Professor for Journalistic Innovation at the... Craig, 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 got the whiff and poofs in just for that graduate school of journalism at the city university of new york hello mr jarvis hey sam that's a long-standing joke we won't bother us playing poor I sam lesson i tell you <laughs> hey so guess who's here this is a thrill this i'm, I'm very excited i've been a fan of sam's uh, since he came up with drop.io which was the greatest little way to share files uh facebook bought it uh, and then you worked at facebook for how long were you at facebook sam I was there about I was almost exactly four years. Four years. Uh, through the IPO and a lot of the fun. Welcome. And yeah. now uh, he general partner at his uh, 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 VC firm, Slow.co. S L O W. Slow Ventures. Slow Ventures. It's we couldn't get the dot com. I don't know. We're too cheap to buy the dot com. I like Slow.co. I think that's very memorable. <laughs> I love it's it. Slower. And Sam, I, I'd, I'd love to know who, whoever has Sam at slow.com gets a lot of deal flow. I can uh, tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, Sam, you, your ears were burning last week, I'm sure, because and you were all the news all over town uh, because of your investment in creators. And we thought, well, we better get we better get Sam on if we can to uh, to explain this because, you know, traditionally venture capitalists invest invest in companies. Although, as you pointed out, um, you know, you're always investing in the team, you're always investing in the people as much as the the idea. Yeah. What gave you the idea to invest in the people directly? <laughs> 
Well, it's, it's actually, you know, ironically an old idea. So, you know, I guess, you know, we've known each other for what, 10 plus years now. Yeah. Uh, you never since, invested you know, in me. To meet through. I'm just going to point well, that out. You know, didn't, didn't, no one gave me the opportunity, <laughs> but the, um, but, you know, the, 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 when I was literally in senior year of high school, um, you know, I was watching, if you remember way back in the day, Martha Stewart, home living, going yeah. public and all yeah. this stuff. And I was like, you know, and, and I, I started a company, I still own the domain lifecapital.com oh. to try to do this. Right. Um, in high the school? idea was to say, look in high school, well, this is part of how I got into college. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, they were um, so impressed by lifecapital.com. They said, oh. Well, you know, at the time it wasn't, you know, that in, back in those those years, the kids starting companies wasn't quite as common as it is today. So right. I think it was a reasonably original thing to be trying to do. And, you know, back then I, I had the narrative I had was, look, debt's terrible, right? Um, debt forces you to, you go to law school, you have to become a corporate lawyer to pay off your blah, blah, blah. You know, it's stuck, it sticks you in paths. The world is getting crazy and you want people to have as much freedom as possible. Uh, that's how you get the biggest outcomes uh, and the most interesting stuff. So wouldn't it be cool if instead of instead of just having debt for people, you had debt options and equity options, just like you do for companies. Um, back then, everyone thought I was crazy. Um, so, you know, it really, other than a bunch of working with some lawyers and coming up with some ideas and kind of shopping, it never really went anywhere. Um, but fast forward, and it's now been almost, you know, it's been more than 20 years, I guess. And, you know, a bunch of trends have played out that make this make all the sense in the world, right? One is everyone now understands uh, how the internet makes outcomes way more discontinuous than they ever were before. So gone are the days of, you know, you get a career, you have certain pay raises every year, you know your trajectory. That's really easy to finance with debt, but modern careers, you can have a great year, you have a terrible year, you know, some people do amazingly well, you have the, the, the you know, Jeff Bezos of the world, and a lot of people don't, there's a lot of discontinuity. It's super hard to finance well with debt, but people all of a sudden say, oh my God, you know, if I had equity, right, an equity-based approach is way better suited to, to financing that stuff, and that's the big picture. Um, everyone's woken up to the fact that people piling on debt young in their lives is, 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 really, is really quite stifling uh, in a lot of ways. So there's got to be a better way to do this, right? And so there's a bunch of big picture things. And then the specific thing we're starting with that makes it such an opportunity now is the creator economy, right? Where you're seeing these people start effectively micro businesses, just them. In a lot of cases, they're building a brand and a community long before they're building a product. But there's a lot of value being built, and and these people don't have access in general to true equity financing, right? Either they operate off of cash flow. So what we've started to say is it's finally time to do this for real. <clears throat> Let's finance creators as individuals, just like we would any other business. But the really big thing, which I think you know causes maybe the controversy around this, is the way we look at this is if we're going to put five hundred thousand dollars, a million, whatever dollars into a person versus a company, what we say is we're kind of investing in the basket of what you do with that capital uh, over time. So we say there are no restrictions on how you deploy it. It's here to support you. If you want to put it into audience building, great, or product development, whatever you want. But all that money and capital we're putting in is building your brand and your identity, right? And like kind of the value of your community. And so we want to be dealt in over the long term. We say we take a very low percentage over a long period of time, so 30 years, so basically your whole career. And we say, look, you know, we'll give you the capital up front. If you do great, if you're the next, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, we get venture like returns. Right. Um, but if you do don't do well, it's fine. I mean, you know, again, our firm is fundamentally a seed firm. We're used to losing money. We're loose to things not working out. We're not trying to monetize people that don't work. Was it hard to convince the partners that uh, that this made sense? I mean, I don't think there's much of a precedent for it. I, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think. I have questions. A lot of people have yeah. talked about this. So yeah. do I. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Any way you want. I mean, but please. <laughs> well, one thing Are people you... brought up is his indentured servitude. And you, you pretty. Yeah. Uh, who, who brought that up? Can I, can I call out names? Because I, I have to admit, I haven't, I haven't seen nobody the here. episode. Uh, nobody here. Nobody okay, here. But I think good. that uh, is... the mother, in the motherboard interview you did, I think they. Oh, that's true. They did invoke Look, that I'll be phrase. honest. I. I think that that is, uh, I think that's lazy, honestly, to call it indentured servitude. You know, there's no question that culturally, for good reasons, especially in the United States, there's a lot of sensitivity 
around any of these like long term capital oriented relationships, right? We know why we get the contest, but it's actually the opposite of indentured servitude, right? Because you're saying to people, you don't owe me anything. This isn't a record label deal. You know, if I invest in you and you decide to go sit on a beach for the next 30 years, there's nothing I can do about it. That's one of my risks, right? I have no control over what you do, you know, at all. So there's um, no contractual. I would actually argue debt. I'd, I'd actually argue debt is a lot closer to indentured servitude than, than the model or building. Yep. So you you don't have a contractual agreement that they will continue to pursue their creator path or, you know, that they'll keep making no. YouTube videos. Nothing like that. Nothing to protect you. No. Like and in fact, it's actually the opposite. We say if you don't, um, let's pretend you go and flip burgers or you're a corporate lawyer. We have a structure we've kind of come up with or an idea of saying, like, that's not even part of the deal. Like, if you just decide, we take that risk, you know. So you because put a fence the around the activities? You put, you put a fence around the, fence, the definition of the activities? We do, but the fence is basically defined like this, which says, if you go take a job um, where there's a market price for the job, right? Meaning other people that aren't you make the same, doing exactly the same thing, that's out of the deal. If you go oh. and use your expertise you've developed as, I don't know, a food celebrity to work on a food channel show where they're paying you because it's you, right? Um, then we are obviously, we're all dealt out in that part. But we basically are saying like, we'll invest in you in your in the equity of your creator brand in this case we've also done entrepreneurs by the way separate separate structure uh which i don't think was talked about in the motherboard article but is also really cool but for yeah. creators we say look we'll 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 do it that way we ring fence things that are related to the brand you're building and the community you're building um and also the the knowledge and ip you build right as a part of being a creator stacy go ahead see you first are you looking for venture style returns on this? And like, in terms of like, oh, hey, I'm going to have five to six flame outs, a couple decent ones, and then two or one, like 10x returns. Yeah, I mean, I think the the the, the long answer, the, the short answer is yes, right? And and we actually even ring fence, it's not even like ring fenced around, we only monitor, you know, we only, we're looking for failures, but actually the way we structure these deals, we say, if you make less than actually in some cases, quite a bit of money, like a few hundred thousand dollars a year, we don't even want a percentage of that. Like we're not even trying to monetize the okay cases, but our view is that oh. these are hits driven businesses like anything else. And if you do super well because of the capital we put in or helped by the capital we put in, we want to see a big return on it. And the thing people I think need to recognize, which I think if you're an investor around the VC ecosystem, you get, but it's hard for people to understand is that it's very important that we are able to monetize fully the winners, right? That we get our 5% of Jeff Bezos, our $10 billion there, because that makes the cost of capital cheaper for everyone else, right? Um, and that's, a, I think, the really important thing and a lot of how the structure is set up and why we care about it to be 30 years and why it has to be kind of broad-based. Because what you really don't want, the only way the structure fails is not if you have a bunch of losers, because you will, right? Uh, and that's fine. Like, that's part of the model. Um, that's actually part of just the technology future we exist in today yeah. is that it's very discontinuous in terms of who wins and who loses. But you have to make sure you get paid on the winning cases so that you can afford all the losses and all the other cases. <laughs> and I would think it'd be, that's a, an issue just because the more successful you are, the more money you can throw at lawyers to get you out of weird contracts that well, require you to pay 5% of your earnings. <laughs> Well, I think the question is, it's, I don't think it's that weird for what it's worth, but that point, is, it's, it's certainly new, but I wouldn't say it's weird. What I would say is this, the, the thing you have to really protect against is, you know, the Larry Ellison case, which is, you know, a lot of people say, look, we love the deal. Can it be a 10 year deal? Right. Can it be a five year deal? Can we make it shorter? Because 30 is a big number. We say, look, honestly, no, because the problem is it's super easy to borrow, right? To, to, until you to kind of get past profits. the deal terms and then, yeah. and you yeah, mm -hmm, it, right. it's very easy to do. Whereas what we say is we don't ever want to make the people we invest in make unnatural decisions, right? Because of the structure. So take, again, like we'll be silly and use, you know, let's pretend we had bought 5% of Jeff Bezos at the, you know, before he was Jeff Bezos. To this date, we only monetize when he sells, right? No profits for him, no profits for us. So in his case, we'd still be waiting, right? Because he hasn't <laughs> sold very much, you know, he's just borrowed. But but honestly, I, I'm fine with that, right? Because the reality is, is we would still have a very monetizable asset in what we have. And someday, in some level, he will sell, right? You'd in like some to, form, even like if to, it takes a generation. You'd like to make it until death do you part, really. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, because, but that's, I think, the spirit of what we do. Yeah. Um, but... In practice, even I got convinced by the lawyers that 30 years is a good bound. <laughs> <laughs> Infinite's not good. So, so far, uh, the one we know about is your investment in a YouTuber, Marina Mulgilko. 
uh, 31 yeah, years no, no, old. No, no. She's yeah. a YouTube personality. You gave her 1.7 million. Uh, yep. And and what else? You know, I'm thinking about the, the traditional way of doing this is is kind of more like an agent. Where or a manager, yeah. where somebody would say, "Hey, look, I like you, kid. You're going places. Give me a ten percent or more uh, uh, of the bookings I get you, and we'll work together." And then the agent goes out and promotes this person with, and, with uh, no risk. The agent has no risk. The agent has no risk and only has ten uh, percent. And bad. And, well, the agent has no risk. He also has bad incentives, right? Which is the other. Well, problem, doesn't he have good incentives? Because he's only going to make ten percent of what he of the jobs he gets you. Yeah, but the thing is, the problem with the agent model, and this is with respect for agents, we love to work with a lot of them. But again, it is a sweat equity role where your job is to basically make the person as much money as you possibly can until you get fired and they move on. Right. And <laughs> right. so because, you know, it, it incentivizes a lot of short term thinking, bookings, right. there's also no dollar investment. Right. Which in the end of the day, you think about what really unlocks growth and potential. It's capital is pretty useful, right? Telling people, you know, I'll take 10% of whatever I bring in. Let me go be a salesman for you, right? Uh, which is effectively what agents do right. is is a very different model. In fact, you know, one thing we have to work really hard to educate people on is that we're capitalists. We're not service people. So, you know, I talk to a lot of creators and they say, great, like we love the capital. Like what services do you provide? Yes, what and do I'm I always, get besides jokingly, the money? Yeah. Someone telling me I was like nothing, nothing. I give you nothing. But not I'm, even the I'm traditional money, right? advisory role of a venture. No, of, of course, a VC? of course we yeah. do that. Of course we do that, and like we have a lot of incentives to do that. But I think I actually do this with with our traditional investments as well. Is I really don't believe in this hybrid service slash capital. Yeah world. I just don't think it makes any sense. I mean, I, I started my career at Bain and Company. I can tell you service businesses are not good businesses and they get competed to, to zero marginal value. And capital, you know, the reason to do this type of a deal with us is because you can use the capital and you know what to do with it. You know, I find entrepreneurs who are asking for all the support and services, among other things, same thing with creators, it's actually kind of a pretty negative signal about what they know what they're uh -huh. getting themselves into. Uh -huh. Right. You're going to make so, it easy for so me, So we try you? to be... Well, yeah. Yeah. We try to say, like, so this look, way you get either money. Right. We <laughs> yeah, that's it. And you get to deploy more capital because you don't have to spend the time on, you know, you want like a traditional VC gets limited to a couple companies. Well, and also, yeah, I mean, I our, would argue that a VC yeah. probably doesn't, no one knows how to make a creator successful at this point. It's so new. I, well, look, well I, I'm very so, negative in general. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead. Go off. for a second. I was going to say, look, in general, look, our, even our traditional seed practice, which is, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say has been extremely successful at Slow Ventures. We don't do board seats, right? Um, we are very good at text messaging. I think we're very good advocates. We have a very high net promoter score with the people that, that we do investment with. But we try to be very anti-service, partially for scalability, but partially because, again, I just I think, you know, if people knew how to cookie cutter make startups successful, um, or cookie cutter make creators successful. Yeah, yeah. We live in a very different world. This Absolutely. is hard. No and, one you know, knows. Yeah. There are things that are valuable, but I think you got to call a spade a spade and say, you're doing something super hard. We respect the talent. We respect what you've accomplished so far and what you can respect. If 1.5 million, 5 million, whatever the number is, demonstrably changes your trajectory, helps you do way better. You know how to deploy the capital. We're all ears. If you want, you know, someone to cry to cry to and, and to, you know, be your partner and everything, like I think that's just a misread of what capital does for people. Right. <laughs> it's still lonely. Right. <laughs> so Sam, I, I you... want to get my head around this better if I can. Um so yeah. at, at at our at our little journalism school, the Craig, 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 Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, um I started a program in entrepreneurial journalism and it was basically, hey kids, let's start a company. But that didn't, it worked for a, a while, but, but starting a company is difficult. It's more than journalists do. Uh, it's not investable. Uh, so we, we changed it recently because there are so many new ways for creators to make money, uh, Substack, Kickstarter, Patreon, et al. And so it's now aimed at the individual um, journalist, most cases, trying to serve directly a market or a community. Uh, using yep. all these tools as a creator. So yep. uh, I've got two questions for you. The first is whether we should be looking at that as a model to support this kind of journalism going forward. Yep. And then this, I'll come to my second question. Go, go, go with that first. So I think the answer is probably. Um, you know, I think the the the... The journalism world, um, obviously, you know, you have to look at the, the economics of it. You know, my wife obviously started, you know, a, a right. pretty successful publication as a journalist, you know, building a business that now has, you know, 50 full time employees and like, you know, it's you know profitable in the whole nine yards. 
you know, candidly, it's, a, it's another topic for another day, but I think the, the question of how big of a business can you build on Substack is an interesting one. You know, I think it's, it's mm-hmm. very easy to get started, but it's, it asymptotes very quickly, right, as an individual journalism creator. But I, so I think it's very hard to, to build serious revenue doing that. It's very easy to kind of support a lifestyle or even a very good individual salary doing that. You know, I think the thing to come back to you for our financing model is it works really well when there is a low probability chance of the outcome being enormous, right? Um, You know, Mm -hmm. for a given Mm -hmm. creator. It's hard when it's very, very bounded. So for instance, you know, this model does not work very well if you want to become a doctor, right? Um, Because I know what you're going to make. You're not going to make infinity. You know, it's kind of like, there's there's actually debt is actually pretty good structure for that. The question about whether this works for journalism, I think is a longer conversation. Um, It could, but I think you'd have to look kind of more broadly at, that I think it's hard for print journalism alone um, to support those types of outcomes, <laughs> if that makes sense, oh, amen. Uh, amen. though yeah. possible. Also, so, so the second question, re- related real quickly, if I can, is we talked about this last week, uh, and I think you probably just answered the question, but I still want to try to push this. Is there a model in which you could envision, uh, not, not your exact model, but is there a world in which you could envision the reversal you created becoming the new model for scholarships? That is to say, um, people pay back based on their success in life. And in the total pool, you end up supporting more education and more success with less debt and more sharing. Can I just, I'll stick this in. Yale did this and I signed up for it. It did. It was called the tuition postponement option. And it ended up being kind of horrific because (laughs) you- No one paid. Yeah, well, you borrowed as a pool, right? And yeah. so your entire class borrowed a certain amount of money and the entire class paid it back as a percentage of income, not as a flat amount or with interest, as a percentage of income until the entire class pool had been paid off, which often meant <laughs> this went on for a long time. Um, I didn't borrow that much money, but I borrowed some and we did finally pay it off. It took us about 20 years uh, to do it, but it was a very odd, it was a clever, I think, idea. You're obviously familiar with it, Sam. Yes, I am. There, there have been a f- uh, several experiments in education around this actually over the years. There was, I'm not sure if this is the same one, but Yale also did a, a program like this in a long, long time in the law school that was another flavor of this. So it's been tried. There have been issues with repayment. They've stopped There's doing There's a bunch it, of I issues think. that have come. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sure they did. I, I think it was a short lived experiment. I mean, look, people have been sniffing around versions of this idea forever. Um, and it, 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 just stepping all the way back, if we're going to have a society where a small number of people do extremely well and the average doesn't, and it's hard to model those outcomes, that is just a very bad capital product for that future, right? So we say, where does this go in the future? I think there's a whole version. If you told me that actually the right model for society was, and I'm, I'm making this up obviously, but a version of UBI, which is like, you know, when you're 21, the government just gives you a million dollars, right? Every single person, <laughs> right? And then you're getting paid, you're paying it back in the form of taxes. That's not insane, right? In terms of actually raising overall productivity, freedom, and like creating more financial upside for everyone. Like that model, some in some version of UBI makes a lot of sense to me. You know, then I think backing off of it, you know, I think you get to different click stops. But, you know, the answer is I think there's a lot of things you can finance with it, but the, not everything. And I do think, keep in mind the fact that even if you look at traditional companies on a relative basis, risk adjusted basis, if you can get debt, in a way that makes sense, that's a great product, right? I don't want to be like, you know, debt does make sense. Like if there's, you know, even as a company, it, it's really wonderful if you raise some equity that you can then borrow money in certain cases and it's, it's a very capital efficient thing to do. I just think that the reality is for a lot of people, especially creators, especially solo entrepreneurs, there is a hole where there's not a capital product being offered to them and like, we'd love to offer it. You know, it's kind of that simple. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, so, um, so it's just basically a, gr- not a grant, but it's a, uh, you, you give them a certain flat amount of money. Do you find it difficult yep. to, cr- to convince these creators? Uh, see, part, part of my problem is uh, in my world, a creator is not necessarily a good business person. And uh, okay. this is part of the problem is there, and I'm one of them, <laughs> so I can create content to, you know, like crazy, but I couldn't run a business to save my life. In my case, I, I got my wife to run the business for me. Uh, Mr. Beast has his mom running the business. Um, that's part of the problem. Very few Jessica lessons in the world who are both great journalists and know how to start and run a business. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that the future is is more and more creators, though, that are really entrepreneurs and business people as well. And this is not a product that today works for everyone. I mean, you know, people frequently ask me, like, well, how do you convince people to take this? I'm like, I don't, right? Like, I think you put it out there and a small number of people say, this is perfect for me. I get it. And you meet them and you understand how they think about business and what they're trying to build and how they think about content. You're like, yep, this makes sense. But Aren't it's actually you worried a process that you're going to self-select for people who are good business people, but not necessarily great creators? Um, I think that we're learning how to do both, but I think there's a, there is an intersection of those two. Like Marina, I think is a great first example of someone who is both. And like, that's kind of what you're looking for now. Now, over time in history, in the coming years, my sense is, is that a lot of these creators are getting more and more business savvy, right? Because They're they have to, more, right? They have to. It's also, you know, again, like you think about the, the whole system of you're the talent, I'm the agent, you know, right. the Hollywood style system is breaking down. And instead it's going to be, look, you're a content creator. You're blew up on TikTok. You know, you're building independent brands. Good for you. Yeah, like, that's the it, shift. It's a hybrid we, model. We talked about um, that because I come from old media. That's the shift. In the old days, you're a creator. You went to work for a company that would then support your, you know, your efforts uh, and let you do what you do. Um, but I think that that maybe is that over. That's kind of what journalism is uh, too, Jeff, right? Is if you're a journalist, yeah, you, you also, didn't expect you also to start leave, a business. You expected to go to work for a newspaper. And, and, and you also leave, you know, from my days at Time Inc., you leave the, I, I think we, we're leaving the, the uh, not completely, but we're leaving the era of the blockbuster economy. And there's more 15-minute uh, celebrities and there's fewer huge hits. And look what's happening in the music industry. There's more good, sustainable creativity going on than there was, supported in more ways. Uh, and, 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 but is there, you know, is there a next, do you have to have Adele to make it work? Well, but can Sam you, seems, seems to be saying he's investing in Adele's and that makes his model work, yes? Well, I, I think it's, a, look, the answer is we're figuring it out. But I, look, obviously an Adele is great as an outcome. I think it's hard to pick Adele, right? Especially, you know, from zero. And there aren't enough of them. I would note that, you know, it's interesting. As we move towards what I see as kind of a cult-driven future, where there, there's no single mass mm -hmm. media, we're not all watching Seinfeld, yes. Amen, right? Brother. But, but you know, curb your enthusiasm for a niche is just as powerful and it's a big niche and it's global. You know, there's a lot of very, very, very so large that's plenty bigger that are developing. I think it's, you know, I think that, you know, there are enormous businesses being built in these weird internet niches. I think that's only going to continue. You know, we talk about quote unquote metaverses and whatever. I mean, there's no question there's a fracturing of what was once the global single dialogue into thousands of smaller dialogues but those thousands at you know set with seven billion people online they're still very big and the reality is the engagement with them is higher than ever right, right. so you know so, mr beast is with. not on cnbc but mr beast has a hell of a following and can monetize the crap out of it right and so i so think you could, you could really i, I actually think that's kind of more cluster. the world sorry I, yeah i, I got delayed yeah you could really be built for a post think blockbuster. It's, 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 creator economy i think it's post i think it's post blockbuster creator economy with every once in a while there will be a blockbuster yeah. right? okay um, like just because it happens yep. and if you're on them great right um but i don't think you can manufacture those necessarily no nope. <laughs> so if you put in 1.7 million dollars it doesn't take much of a return to get that money back over 30 years even at five percent. Yeah, but remember, we're venture capitalists, so we need to make a lot more than our money back to, to justify it to our LPs. What, so, yeah. So what do you what do you expect? What do you want? I mean, look here, here's my here's my honest answer. You know, we're trying to make this a strong IRR deal that works for us on a long term basis. We're actually not actually targeting what would be traditionally considered venture capital returns. You know, our the stuff we do in crypto, the stuff we do with SaaS, you know, has a very different return signature because in five years. You know, we're going to have markups from Series A firms, and then we're going to have public, people can go public. Etc. We don't expect the same curves here. Um, for now, we're financing this kind of out of our own vehicles. We're learning a lot. We think they're very strong deals, and we're, we're, we're able to kind of work in the ecosystem in cool ways. My bet is, is that for this to get really big, though, you will have separate funds that are not actually venture capital. Maybe they're run by venture capitalists like me, but they're, they have different return profiles and different return targets. Um, not to mention like more technicalities, like for instance, venture capitalists generally hate getting money back. Like we hate profits. Um, turns out that like creators generally do generate those, right? They, well, you, you want know, an exit? <laughs> are you saying you want an exit? Is that what you're saying? No, well, they, yeah, they want to build out your companies. There's no exit uh, with a creator unless they. <laughs> not, not yet. I think that, and that's the other thing. Again, Peter. you talk about what you know. 
Well, look, I think I wrote an article, you know, over the summer that I was I was pretty proud, got pretty widely distributed and read about how kind of the end of this era of venture capital. And what it basically the point was, if you look at SaaS investing, consumer investing, this was a weird niche thing being done on the West Coast where no one understood the financial models. And so venture capitalists who had an opinion about it could make a lot of money. But just like any good industry, now everyone understands the models. Everyone understands how to think about a SaaS valuation. There are public comps, like there's a whole market apparatus around it, which is why you see the big East Coast firms, you know, the hedge funds coming in like crazy. And I'd actually argue that a lot of traditional internet investing is really not venture capital anymore, right? So our job as real venture capitalists, right, is to go out and find the new things where there's a capital gap where people could use money to do amazing things, but don't have access to it, put money in, and then the reality is the models have to be built, the capital pipelines have to be built. You know, you're gonna need some version of a quote unquote public market, probably won't be the New York Stock Exchange, might be in crypto, right? Um, where you can kind of think about how these things eventually trade, things like that. So, you know, what we envision here is just very first principles, two things. There's no question that from a first principles perspective, a a equity oriented product for creators, true equity makes a lot of sense and that there's real demand for it. There are great creators out there that can use the capital. And then there's a whole bunch of missing things from models to, you know, liquidity options, whatever that don't exist yet that we think will come to exist. But we think the way you do that is by starting to just go um, and like help build the ecosystem around it over time. Stacy, would you have done, would you have sought this at, at a point in when you were starting your venture? No, no. I think venture capital <laughs> is the devil for building any sort of business um, that you want to be sustainable. Like journalism is just not a business that fits with something like this. I'm, well, I'm for what it's worth, Stacey. Yeah. And for what it's worth, Stacey, I actually, I mean, like, and Jeff, I mean, I think you know this, like my wife, you know, despite the fact that I am a venture capitalist, you know, the information has never taken a dime of venture capital. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's been self finance <laughs> from day one because. I generally agree, right? Which is that especially journalism is generally a very poor fit historically for venture capital. It doesn't grow fast enough. It creates weird pressures. It's way better, mm -hmm. uh, especially with a long-term mission to not have it. Um, but again, that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions to that. You know, Axios yeah, has done really well with venture capital. You seem I to think. thrive, Sam, in um, in unstable environments. You, your point in your uh, your uh, piece in the information was that venture capital is basically just turning into finance. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's clearly, investing in a creator ecosystem is something that's you're you're throwing your your money into a into a turbulent pool because it's so fastly it's so changing so fast and it's so unknown. Do you think that's where the opportunity lies though is in these eras of great change? I mean, look, I absolutely that's what I think. I mean, I think, you know, again, you know, look at our venture firms. We have made far and away more money um in the crypto ecosystem than anything else. And and why? It's because in the 2017 era, when no other venture firms were doing it, or very few, we heavily invested in a bunch of the layer one protocols like Solana that have become, you know, some of the most important protocols of the moment, you know, in crypto and, and pretty foundational. I think that it's pretty simple, you know, putting capital where capital isn't is the way you make yeah. all the returns. And also, yeah, frankly, also it's how you have an impact. Um, it's how you have an impact too. I mean, I, I do believe in having an impact and I believe capitalism is good. You know, simply bidding on, you know, bidding up the same things everyone else is investing in is both very boring. Um, and it's also, it's very, I don't think it's that profitable. And I think it's very low impact. Whereas using capital and kind of the freedom that venture capital allows you to, to have, to go with a new thesis into new spaces and push the envelope, you're going to lose money all the time, right? Like I, I joke that I think one of my maybe advantages is I don't mind losing money as long as I make a lot of money sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's uh, article in the information, investing directly in people is the future of VC. Here's how to do it really is a, a roadmap for this and fascinating. And uh, he, he's an intern I, at the information, which I think is hysterical. <laughs> and <laughs> I would love to hear, Sam, what types of creators... You're in, like, usually when people talk about creators, they think, you know, oh, it's a TikTok person. It's someone on YouTube or Instagram. But there are other, I mean, you mentioned an entrepreneur's fund too. So I'd be curious, like, what specifically you're looking for on the creator side. And if you actually could talk about the entrepreneur thing, I'd like to hear it. 
Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, look, on the, the creator, especially in the last year, has uh, been so, so overused as a term. It basically means anyone doing anything, right? Um, so it's a very diffuse term. <laughs> you know, in general, we are not looking for the 15 minutes of fame folks in party houses in Los Angeles, you know, who want to quickly, you know, get a bunch of followers and, you know, do some silly videos and, and go from there. I think we're much more interested in people that are developing you know, potentially niche, but like deep communities um, of like that are engaged with them and, and, you know, with the kind of products they're interested in, in potentially small verticals. So I'll give you an example. It's like, you know, could be juggling, right? Someone who's like, you know, the, the king of that or magic or, you know, in Marina's case, she's a very strong, like Russian, you know, uh, base uh, looking at Silicon Valley and, and trying to be entrepreneurs, um, languages. So basically, we're very interested in those kind of niches um, where you have like a real community being built that might be instead of it being like a you know community that's just on one platform, it actually has some currency to be cross platform, right? So if you see creators that have not just like a big YouTube channel, but or but have like really shown the ability to move that audience between a few different platforms and potentially engage them in a few different ways, that's the most exciting to us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think look, I think the other kind of angle to all of this is. Uh, another kind of catchphrase for this is I do think we're moving into what I call like a cult driven economy uh, in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And those kind of when you think about those cults or those networks, I investing in and supporting the people who are effectively the cult leaders or building those interest groups uh, and, and kind of maintaining them and driving them is kind of the core, the core thesis. So it can be, it can be anyone. It's not just you know, people on one network or, you know, people who make a certain kind of content, it really is just about that, that stickiness and relationship with their fans and the community that I think matters the most. Sam, you're, you you're, see yourself you're, wait, we're right. going to have to let Sam go. Cause we've, we only, we, we said we'd take him for half an hour. I don't oh, want to. hell, I thought we could hold him for the whole time. No, <laughs> I, I, look, I would love to come back. I, you know, as you know, I, a few diapers. things in the family front means I have a little just, bit of a limited time. You just today. had a baby, for Christ's sake. You <laughs> yeah, got to spend yeah. some time. But I do want to say congratulations on finally finding a use for that domain you registered 20 years ago, lifecapital.com. You're going to have a Life Capital uh, event, Life Capital 2021, the future of the professional creator ecosystem co-hosted by slow ventures and uh, the information that's coming up in april shocker who the co-hosts are <laughs> how did i get them i love it that uh, that despite being married to a vc uh, jessica took no money for the invent the information that's it's that's a great that's a great relationship you two have congratulations <laughs> on uh, on your new addition to your family it's really great to catch up with you again sam it's thank great to catch up as well thank you guys yeah, i'm really I, great to honestly see you all. after you explain it i I am very impressed by what you're doing, your willingness to take a big chance. And when you describe it as kind of the alternative to debt for raising money for individuals, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, you say in your information uh, piece, uh, oh, I love this line. Let me see. And especially because I'm old, you said... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Why? Because young people have all the equity value in the form of their future sweat and ingenuity but without the ability to unlock it, we're stuck in a world where old people rule the roost. I think you got a, yep. you're onto something. Yep. Congratulations, Sam. It's a real pleasure to see you again. It's great to see Thanks. you guys. Thanks for thanks Thank for you, having Sam. me. We'd love to do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. We'll <laughs> have you back anytime. Go. Yeah. Slowcapital.com. Absolutely. All right. Take care, Sam. Talk to you. Yeah, Bye, guys. I, Thank I, you. I hate to cut him off, but uh, uh, well, that was so great to have that opportunity. He's Thank so you. smart. No. Yeah. Oh, he's still Thank there. Thank you, guys. It's, forget I I'm said that. I'm still on. It, forget I said that. No, I will forget. But it, but it, is, it is good to see you. Wait, now it is when we say the bad things. And, <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you guys. And, and, and happy to do more more on this or whatever you guys also want later. To. You know, I'm a big love fan to. of oh, all of you. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and I love your red aftershocks good to see you. headphones, too. They're a sponsor. So. Thank you. I, I like them. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Talk to you guys. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, now you can say the good things. <laughs> he really is uh, very eloquent and I think well-spoken. I think he made it, I don't know, what do you guys think? you think he made a good case for what he's doing? Stacey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for that subsegment, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, like you, Jeff, I'm still like, ooh, how do you fund journalism as a real business? And we still don't. And forget that. Maybe, forget no, that. Forget yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, forget well, that. Well, I'm trying. I, I'm well, no, try. I mean, you can't blame a guy for yeah. trying. I, I think... I will say, as a lifestyle business, I do super well. It's a well, great lifestyle business. I think yes. as having is, say, resources. As do we. Yeah. 
But if you could pool some resources to protect against things like lawsuits, I think lifestyle people could oh, go after more yeah. uh, like larger stories. I mean, like there are certain things I probably would never take on one because it would take too much time away from like what generates the most revenue for me. But also because it'd be terrifying if the company of a bigger company tried to sue me because I would just be like, yeah, OK. <laughs> I mean, if there's any argument I have against this is it does, frankly, it's going to foster it's going to they're going to invest in people who have a chance for explosive growth. And that's never going to be lifestyle businesses like journalism. But that's uh, no, OK. Not, and, I mean, and as he said that, you know, being a physician, being a journalist, you know, borrowing might be a good context for that because you got a steady payback at a certain amount of time. Uh, I, I don't know if journalists get a steady payback, but sure. Yeah, well, that yeah, then that then you got a bigger problem. Well, so, I mean, so switch you to music. A, you can't make a a, a a a bad financial a bad business model work by throwing money at it. It's if it's a bad business model, it's a bad business model. Period. Well, B2B, I think this could work. B to B is small. Switch to music, right? So the music industry is is is, is long tail, and making it work at that. So I guess part of the question is how big is big enough to make it work in Sam's model? How many at what sizes does he need to make the model work? Um, you know, the question I was going to ask is, 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 in a sense, he becomes a new patron of the arts. We talked about the difference between this and, and, and the Middle Ages and the Renaissance last time. But there's it's a interesting big, to wonder who there's he a big was difference supporting. Because a patron of the mind. arts gets no returns. Exactly. All they get is yes. Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling and that's that. Exactly. Uh, but he will end up supporting creativity nonetheless. And so what kind of creativity will end up working best and being supported here and what will the impact of this be if this model takes off? Well, that's what I we mean. We only speculate. Uh, I, uh, oh, it's you, could, have... you could look at what worked on Facebook. So you get a bunch of like crazy, chaotic people. Well, it's got to um, have a strong doing... upside over 30 years. So that's not a okay. lot of things. Okay. Oh, what is he? <laughs> and I think Can also- you think of any creator was... that you followed over 30 years? Well, that's, that's going to be interesting. I mean, there are some- A lot of authors, there certainly. Are, there are some um, people out okay. there- John like... Le Carre- you know, but yeah. and, and it's too early to know whether any of the successful YouTubers will have a a 30 year career. Nobody has yet. I mean, even PewDiePie, uh, I would think, is kind of on the wane. Um, Marquez I Brownlee, I don't you know, well, he might have a career for 30 Marquez's years. Marquez's journalism and Marquez's value. Marquez is a different uh, value perspective. It's like yours. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think probably. There. I, I don't know what their metric is, but probably you're not going to see Marquez or Twit have explosive growth. Uh, it's going to be more like slow but steady. Uh, you have value. Yeah, you're not a cult, and you that's are, why right? I kind of tried to ask him because you can get <laughs> you can get your money back on 1.7 million over 30 years at five percent. That's not so hard to do. Uh, Marquez would surely deliver those kind of returns. He wanted more than that, though. He wanted a big hit, and that's right. That's interesting, but I don't think it fosters journalism. That we still, I don't have, I don't think we're ever, and we're going to have to rely on the Craig Newmarks. That's true patronage, by the way. That's not. It is indeed. It yeah, is indeed. That's not. A, that's patronage. Um, but but, but look what he back gets to, back: a barbershop quartet. <laughs> barbershop quartet. Yes. He gets love and adulation. Uh, you know, and he I does. think Jeff Bezos. Do you think pigeons. he thinks he's going to make money on the Washington Post? Um, he is. He's making money. On yes, it. but yeah, not I mean, on a cash flow basis. He's cash but flowing, a, but he's not going to be rich on it. He no, no, no. But it didn't need to be. It didn't need to be. So that's no. another kind of patronage. But there is, it is. Yeah, there's societal cachet. He gets invited to some pretty cool parties because right. of it. As the right. publisher, well, but he also he also demonstrated how you can make journalism successful and good. Uh, it's the problem I have is that if that's what we're counting on. I, that, uh, oh yeah, that's not great, right? Yeah, great. <laughs> It'd be much better if journalism had some sort of viable business model. That's that's my that's my life's calling. Yeah, yeah, you can't rely um, on the kindness of strangers forever. But that's where the individuals serving communities, to me, continues to make sense because journalism as a whole is wildly inefficient. We keep on repeating each other's stuff. We rewrite each other. Uh, whereas Stacy is doing unique reporting that has value. The amount of unique reporting that that is provided by the journalism broad tent that we call it is a small percentage actually. So a lot of it is Enter just enterprise creepy. journalism yeah. and that, you know, enterprise reporting. And unfortunately that's the most expensive, most complicated. And, and, and you mentioned lawsuits. And I didn't it, even realize you were worried about risky, that, yeah. but it's risky. Yeah. 
And it takes, it takes experience. I mean, like the reporter that I am today versus the reporter I started out at is 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago is very different. Right. And mm-hmm. we don't have, I mean, I don't know how many journalists make it all the way through the filter, right? Like how many people are journalists for their entire career? That's. But the other, the other thing is there are other ways to contribute to the public wheel. You don't have to be a capital J journalist. Um, Somebody's talking about Phil DeFranco who's been doing YouTube for 15 years successfully. There are, and I think Marquez Brownlee is that it's kind of journalism, but it's a little different flavor of journalism. I think you can contribute to the conversation without being a traditional journalist. So, oh, yes. I, yeah. Oh, so yes. I think that we're just look at. That's why I was fascinated because Sam is really wading into a turbulent era <laughs> and saying I'm going to pick winners. It's kind of crazy. Time but I, but I like that. that. I like what he said. I do said too. Yeah. He, he put somebody. Where, I don't think where he's trying to. Pick, any. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he's trying to pick winners. I think he's trying to spread some money to like potential. Oh, we should have asked winners. Him. Well, well, I mean, he's he's admitting that, you know, he's many of he's them will be losers, for, but you're still trying to pick ones that'll win. Well, yeah, but I mean, nobody throws money indiscriminately around. I mean, well, it's like making course. a movie, right? Most movies are flops. It's the blockbuster model. Enough make money that it's a good business to be in. You still think about every script you produce. You hope to make a blockbuster each time out, right? I'm sure he doesn't throw money at creators he doesn't think are going to be. Success, well, just you know. like just like a publisher, just like a yeah. a um, yeah. yeah record it, label. It can be a blockbuster model, but that doesn't mean you just you know give money away. You kind of you want a winner every single time. Well, but the, but the difference is you could you could with the capital that existed in let's say music or in publishing or in movies, you could afford to make only so many. Now, where where Sam I think has something here. And again, this is where this, the scale is so interesting. Is that sorry cliche, but long tail. When you have so many more genres, I, I, in, in, in the Gutenberg book, I, I quoted numbers from, from a study or from a, an analyst, I think, about the number of genres that were supported in mainstream music before oh, yeah. and now. Totally. And it's, it's and forget the number of artists within those genres then. Yeah. And so each of those is a cult. Yeah, and, I loved how he said that. Yeah, I think that's exactly yeah. right. And that, and that these niches will be big enough to support that kind of investment. Uh, Which I great. love. Yeah, I love. Yeah, I do too. And the it's mass media. The more I on. study it, the more I study it, the more I realize how short-term a phenomenon mass media yeah. was. It was a blip. Tense. It was a blip. It was. It was steam power, penny yeah. press, yeah. Uh, magazines. Um, I just got another new book about 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 this. I'm about to dig into uh, that argued that the magazines were the were the basis of 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 mass media, um, and. It led to mass marketing, mass advertising, advertising and attention support for media. It led to all these things, some good, supported a lot of creativity, some awful. It's What we're seeing, I think, on the internet is the death throes of That's that right. model. I agree. The worst of Facebook, the worst of the internet, yeah. the worst of clickbait is the death throes of that model. I agree. So what are the new models that come along? Are, uh, that's what interests me and that's what interests him and that's what I love about it. Yeah. Let's take a little break. That was great. Thank you, Sam, for joining us. Our yes. show today brought to you by Akamai, Hawaiian for cool, man. I love Akamai. You probably know the name. Akamai powers and protects life online. It's changing how we live, work, and play. That sounds like a bold vision, but it really is. If you want to be on the cutting edge of innovation, you need to be operating at the edge of the internet, and nobody can get you there better than Akamai because Akamai has... 10 times the locations of the nearest competitor, over 4,000 points of presence. That means you're always closer to your end user with Akamai. They've built the largest, most sophisticated edge platform in the world so that the biggest innovators can power and protect their greatest ambitions. Now, it's interesting because it's not just getting your content to the edge. It's also securing at the edge. If you go to Akamai.com slash twig, you'll see how Akamai both powers and protects life online for your customers. Akamai, because they're on the edge, has unrivaled edge platform intelligence. They see what's going on in the internet, which helps them stop some of the most dangerous threats launched at the internet and everyone online every day. They avoid bottlenecks. They defend at the edge. 
They've got experts and threat researchers on the front lines of protecting and delivering digital experiences. And, and because they're right there and because of their size, they can help your developers build better apps and put experiences closer to their customers. It's not a surprise. Akamai is trusted by all 50 top global media companies. All 50. All top 20 global e-commerce companies. All top 50 global telecom carriers. Over 500 banks globally, including the top 25 in the U.S. and 22 of the top 25 in Europe and the Middle East. That's kind of stunning. The top 25 banks in the U.S. And, of course, with banks, it's not just about being at the edge and providing faster service. It's also about being secure. And Akamai does both. Akamai's industry-leading zero-second SLA and 100% platform availability mean they have your back. They're not afraid to stand behind their commitments. If you look at your Akamai SLA, it includes time to mitigate, quality of mitigation, time to alert notification, time to respond, time to access a mitigation resource, individual TMM SLAs, all based on specific attack vectors. They can make those commitments because they deliver. Akamai keeps your digital experiences closer to users than anyone and it keeps the threats farther away. That's just the bottom line. And you'll always be one network hop away from 85% of the world's internet users. Akamai is there powering, protecting digital experiences in a way no one can. Ten times the locations of the competition. The fastest customer experience available. The market leader in CDN, video delivery, web performance, DDoS prevention, and web application firewall. No one can compete with Akamai when it comes to setting you up for success and scalability online. Check it out, Akamai, A-K-A-M-A-I dot com slash twig to learn how Akamai powers and protects life online. Give your customers the best possible experience online. See for yourself what life with Akamai is all about. Akamai dot com slash twig. We thank them so much for their support of this week in Google. You support us, by the way, as you do with all our advertisers by using that special address so they know you saw it here. Akamai dot com slash twig. Twig. Uh, so Wirecutter tweets, we were not able to make a deal with the New York Times. So starting today and through the 29th, they urge you to boycott Wirecutter. And they 100% of uh, Wirecutter's unit will be striking from Thanksgiving through Cyber Monday. That's a big deal. I wanted to mention it because I, I want to support these guys. Uh, I think the wire. Yeah, I, I tweeted yeah. it, so none of us go to the wire cutter to buy some stuff. Not me. Um, the Intelligencer, New York Magazine. Here's the best strike for most people: <laughs> playing, <laughs> playing on the wire cutters. Cor <laughs> Corey Sika is brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if she wrote the uh, headline. He, he, he wrote the headline, but boy, that's a great headline. Um, they d he. He does find uh, a former New York Times executive who said, yeah, uh, many times staffers don't believe their work is journalism at all. The pay scale is substantially different from time salaries. Um, it, you know, they look down at the wire cutter folks. I guess I understand. You know, they're the, this, oh, I've yeah. seen this Having forever. joined Time Inc., yeah. Yes, as part of their digital department. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah, you're great. And then you would get these like snippy little things where they're like, no, you're just like a Kia. We're the Ferrari. And you're like, mother pluckers. Oh yeah. Don't we had the same that. experience, you know, when we had a website for a TV show, the website's like, oh, you, oh, you dirty yeah. web people. Yep. yep. I mean, um, that made sense in like 2002. It doesn't make sense in 2020 yeah. Yeah. or 2015. Wirecutter it has was a big recruited, deal. Go ahead. Wirecutter recruited 10,000 subscribers in its first month behind the paywall. That's the kind of Good revenue God. that makes a big difference to the New York Times. So, yeah. it's it also interesting that that per, uh, Perpich, who's a who's a family member, uh, who is in charge of this, and I've had him at events at the school because uh, we have we have a community practice on commerce. So Wirecutter has been there, been very helpful in, in helping other media companies understand how to do this. It really struck me. I think it was about eight months ago or so. I started seeing Wirecutter on the homepage of the New York Times. And I actually emailed him and said, well, congratulations. That's amazing. And he said, yeah, it was a very big deal that they were doing that. And, and so part of the problem here, yeah, it's different. Yes, it, it's commerce. It touches filthy lucre, uh, capitalism. Uh, nonetheless, if it helps support the journalism, you would think the journalists would be uh, nicer to it. Yeah. Well, no. sometimes you have to stand up and I say, know, Stacey. we want yeah. to be treated better. And that's what they're doing. And so uh, is a boycott 
Is a so so a strike is one thing. Is a boycott? Um, I'm just asking this a question. I don't really have an opinion on it. A, a, a line too far? No. I mean, no. whenever you go on strike, you say don't cross the picket line. Now with a with a virtual property, there's no picket line to go right go, go right. to the wire cutter store. So it's just saying don't cross our picket line. Don't use the wire cutter. Um, now it's interesting because it's not only behind a paywall, although it's a pretty pretty loose paywall. I think you get ten articles before you're you're dinged to pay for it. Nevertheless, they also make, and I would bet the the lion's share of the money they make from affiliate fees from their links. So I wonder if it even is behind the paywall because the whole point is that make is to make money is. on the commerce. No, it is, yeah. but it's a very it's a loose paywall. Um, yeah, it's for people like me who go in and like read the. I actually read the wire cutter for fun. I'm like, I do too. And you know what? what? I pay, and I've been paying for 30 years for Consumers Union, for Consumer Reports. They don't have any advertising. Uh, I think it's good to support this kind. This is real journalism. Should I buy it's that service product? Journalism. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, and and uh, this is of course their biggest weekend because it's Black Friday and uh, Cyber Monday. So they're hitting them. They're hitting the times where it hurts. I'm surprised they couldn't come to a, an agreement before this strike. It's got to be. They probably, I bet mainstream America is not going to know. Like we know because we're freaking journalists, right? right? But right. like my mom, no idea. Yeah. Actually, she might she might shop just to spite the unions because she's like somewhat evil sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how do you feel about uh, crypto investors? Boy, the people who tried to buy the Constitution, Constitution Dow. <laughs> this did not work out in so many ways. Uh, first of all, they raised forty million, but the they kind of got screwed by what they call the gas fees. They were doing it in Ethereum, and unfortunately, it's very expensive. I didn't realize how high the gas oh, fees oh, are. Oh, it's, it's very ridiculous expensive now. So much so, uh, in fact, uh, there was one journalist. I want to give him credit. Um, is it Vice? Yeah, Somebody, advice, I think. they bought $200, uh, put $200 into the, uh, so I should explain what's going on. Sotheby's last week auctioned off one of the 13 remaining print copies of the U.S. Constitution, uh, uh, printed in that era. Uh, and uh, it, it went for $43 million to, ironically, a hedge fund CEO, Ken Griffin, who, and it all ties back in, whose hedge fund was the hedge fund that put money into Robinhood during the stonk GameStop short sell. So, <laughs> so it's all kind of coming around. Uh, <laughs> and I have to think there was this a little bit of this revenge angle in him. So a couple of lessons learned. One, it's no good to go into an auction when everybody knows what your top bid is. Yeah. And why Kenneth Griffin offered m any more than a dollar more than the top the Dow folks could offer is beyond me. But maybe somebody else was in the bid. Well, a little big swing in uh, bank yeah, account there. Yeah, I could throw in a few extra million. What the hell? Gotcha, you digital <laughs> ninnies. Uh, the other thing is you really got to consider the gas fees. So the vice put in 200 bucks. And effectively, you can get a refund, but you have gas fees going in and you had gas fees going out. And ultimately, a lot of people ended up upside down on their contribution. So now they own, oh, and that was another crazy thing. And thank you to Vice for, for getting this all sorted out. There was, you, when you bought into this, you got some purpose created cryptocurrency, dollar sign people tokens. One million tokens per one ether ether, ether uh, donated. Those tokens were originally going to be here's how we vote on where the Constitution is displayed because they wanted to display it to the public. At least to, you know they weren't going to tear it up into twelve thousand pieces <laughs> and, or something like that. The, the, the million dollar web page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, then uh, because they lost the bid, they they basically said, "Oh, the." Token's worthless. People have been trying to sell it, by the way. <laughs> you were trying to sell their token. <laughs> it's just everything wrong with the crypto environment all bundled into one big blob. Uh, some people expected to be able to either flip their tiny ownership stake in the Constitution. See, anytime you got crypto, you got 
speculation. Yeah, or you got the, the flippers. Dollar people tokens for a profit. This did start happening over the weekend, according to Vice, with some investors selling tokens on decentralized exchanges such as Uniswap. Uh, and it wasn't against the rules. Constitutional Dow, Constitution Dow said, yeah, that's okay. But then on Saturday, <laughs> this past Saturday, Constitution DAO announced that it would be moving away from the peop people token to a new yet to be created token called We the People. <laughs> and people would go by the wayside because we didn't get the Constitution. And so that was all about that. And then a lot of people got upset because it cratered the price of their dollar sign people. Hundreds of angry messages on the Discord. Uh, so then they changed their mind on Sunday night. We're going to go back to the original plan. And now people is worth something. We're not going to create we the people. Oh, my God. I have a very fundamental dumb question here. Which, which I tweeted, which is, wouldn't this have worked on Kickstarter? Yeah. We only, we only put in the money if, if, yeah. if you actually do this. That would have been so much and better. And we could actually put in fiat currency, and we wouldn't have any gas. And somebody said back in Twitter, what's well, that's just so Web 2.0, Jeff. So let me give well, you the, the You don't get the speculators, the dumb money that's like, yeah, what the hell? Yeah. So this is the process uh, Vice went through to, to contribute $200. First, we had to buy Ethereum on an exchange. We used Coinbase. We bought $200 worth of Ethereum. Coinbase took a $3 fee. Then we had to send the Ethereum from Coinbase to a MetaMask crypto wallet. To do this, we had to pay a $12 network fee. Then we had to send the Ethereum from MetaMask to Juicebox, which was running the, the, the constitutional DAO thing. So-called gas fees vary wildly and depend on how busy the Ethereum network is at any given moment in the complexity of the transaction. Right now, gas fees in Ethereum are very high, and a highly complex operation could end up costing hundreds of dollars in fees. In our case, they paid a $75 gas fee to contribute roughly $75 to the project. Of the initial $200 we bought in Ether, $90 was eaten up in fees simply to donate. Uh, and then if you wanted to get a refund, you have to do that all in reverse. So to get our Ether back from Juicebox, we'd have to pay gas fees again, meaning essentially the entirety of the amount invested would be wiped out. Half of all the people who contributed are in this boat, according to Constitution DAO. 17,000 donors, median donation size $206. A significant percentage of these donations came from wallets that were made for the very first time. Oh. Yeah, so that yeah. you're that's to your point, Jeff. A lot of a lot of people go, Oh, I'm gonna get in on this one. That means about half of the people who donated are now gonna either lose basically everything they put into Ethereum network fees. So who gets rich? By the way, it's the same thing with NFTs. Who makes money in NFTs? The people who generate the NFTs, the the miners who charge the gas fees. That's who's making money on all this stuff. <sighs> yeah, well, that, I mean, that's not terrible. I mean, if you are a creator, then NFTs might be interesting to you because you can generate NFTs, get the fees. But if you don't sell that, if you can, can't sell that NFT, you still had to pay the fee to generate it. And the people who made, well, my point is, they're the they're Oh, the yeah, Levi's. there's always going to be a platform. They're the people making the picks for the gold miners. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to be, in the long run, the people who are going to make the money because... They make it on well, every That's not true. I mean, there will be the few gold miners who make money and yeah. some that will make a little money. And then, and you need picks and shovels. I mean, let's not, nobody was demonizing the people making picks and shovels back in. No. It feels like you're kind of demonizing the platforms here. Well, uh, no. you're, 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 it's not the picks and shovels. It's the, it's the boat captain who's going to rip you off, getting you up to the gold country. Yeah. Oh, Okay. That's fair. I, I'm just, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know if this metaphor well, works. I don't think the folks works. who organized Constitution DAO made any money on the gas fees. I don't think so. Um, and in fact, they say it was a victory. If you go to the website. <laughs> of course they do. They say this project has been such an incredible experience and we are so honored and appreciative to have been on this journey with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's like when I fall down and I hop back up and I go, ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> this project was a landmark event that showed the entire world that a group of internet friends can use the power of it web a lot of money web three another buzzword to face a seemingly insurmountable goal and achieve incredible results on an impossible timeline 
It is our sincere yeah. hope that this project will spark many others that take inspiration from the enthusiasm and accomplishments of everyone involved to use the power of Web3 to make a positive impact on the world. We love you all and are truly humbled to be part of this history together. I think there's a lot of potential to crypto and cyber and blockchain, except that it got taken over by a bunch of crypto bros, male, male jerks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, I don't have a dog in this hunt. I, uh, I, you know, uh, I think probably if you bought into this, you'd. I would hope you didn't expect to get your money back. I mean, what, what were you going to get if they'd won that? You would get nothing. Yeah, exactly. There was there was no way to get the money back. Yeah. What, you, what, what were you selling? There was yeah. no market for. Yeah. yeah. It was. It, that's why it was a charitable thing. Start a five hundred one c three, contribute to it, and you get a tax deduction. At least you got that. Yeah. Do you? I guess you do. Because uh, if you make well, money if on you crypto... you donate to you, charity, yes. Yeah, yeah. But is this a charity? I don't think so. No. Well, you could have you could have said this is an effort to preserve this for the country. We're going to give it to a university to make sure it doesn't fall into the hands of, a, of an evil VC or whatever, or private equity guy. And and we're going to do it through a fiscal agent for a charity. Yeah, in that case, you could. But there's, you don't get any money back. The only way you make any money in that case back is tax deduction. Right. <sighs> Niantic has raised $300 million, the Pokemon Go folks. $9 billion valuation. Why? Because they're in the metaverse business. It's a former Google uh, company. Um, they spun out of Google. They, I think it was the Maps team, wasn't it? They spun out of Google. Their first project... Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, it was in Ingress... <laughs> And then, soon we forget. Yeah, and then they did uh, Pokemon Go, which is a huge success. They've done a few that have been less successful. Did you do the, was it Hogwarts? No, uh, Harry Potter? Yeah, did I they did have the, a Harry Potter? Yeah, they had a good Harry Potter. Well, good in the sense that <laughs> it was Harry Potter. Bad in the sense that it was incredibly boring. Uh, yeah, and I stopped oh. playing it. But we still, you know, Lisa is very much still playing Pokemon Go. I think a lot of people are. I play it every once in a while. It's fun. <laughs> It is uh, fun. And they're, and they're, Even I enjoyed it. Yeah. And they're ready. I mean, some of the success is because it's Pokemon, right? But they're ready to... Uh, they, they believe that the metaverse... John Hankey, who's the founder, referred to the metaverse, the, the ones you saw in Ready Player One, the, the Facebook-style VR headsets, as a dystopian nightmare. Um, Niantic wants to develop technology that brings people closer to the outside world. And that's kind of what Pokemon has done. In fact, billions of miles walked by players playing this game because you have to walk around. You can't just sit at home. Well, I think the collection angle and the fact that it's not like super skills based and there's a little bit of a, you know, I, it's I fun. think there's... And there's Pokemon. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. At Niantic said Hanky. We believe humans are the happiest when their virtual world leads them to a physical one. That actually makes sense to me. Unlike mm -hmm. a sci-fi metaverse, a real-world metaverse will use technology to improve our experience of the world as we've known it for thousands of years. I agree with him on that. That's exactly my objection to traditional VR, is it's isolating. Um, so they, It can be, although you can play with other people. And I would say that you know, Facebook's metaverse does have ways for you to interact with other sure. people and wants and to bring Facebook real sees it as into... social. Yeah. 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 But I like the idea of getting outside, <laughs> join the fresh air. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to be against that. Pokemon Go players have walked 10.9 billion miles in this. Jeez. Well, How many I, times around the earth is that? Lisa goes for a walk every night. And I swear to God, she she says, you know, I, I got to get the sun on my head and I got to feel the fresh air. But she's playing Pokemon Go the whole time. I Excuse swear me, to God. I'm about to go. I'm, I got to leave for a minute. I got to go buy some Croc stock. <laughs> Jeez. She's out there with her Pokemon ball and her Pokemon Go. I mean, it really, it's playing the game. And, but it got her, it gets her outside. It's great. And when, we, when we've traveled, we've played it, and it's really fun. I, I probably told this story. We were in Malta, you know, a little island in the middle of the Mediterranean, and we're in, it's beautiful, medieval town in downtown Malta, and we're playing Pokemon Go, and some Maltese kids come over. But they don't speak English. We don't speak Maltese. And they go, they point, they point at it. We go, okay. And we follow them. Probably not the best idea. We follow them to up and down alleys around. End up in front of the big cathedral. 
and it turns out they were looking for people to help them in a raid. And so we all played together. It was so much. It was amazing. It was a, that a is, great that is communal cool. experience. That's a cool story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm a big fan. See, technology is not a bad thing. No. It's a good thing. Well, yeah. maybe it's a good thing, except in the case of mouse jigglers. <laughs> well, that's a way to get back at bad, evil bosses. That's true. I yeah. uh, Dick D. Bartolo had a mouse jiggler on his Gizway segment. He brings in crappy gadgets for the radio show. And we were both baffled as to the purpose of this thing. Well, Noah Veltman has explained it. Here's his tweet. Today in late capitalism, apparently, there's a whole product category of mouse jigglers, devices to generate random movement from your mouse, so your work-from-home surveillance software thinks you're working. It's also to keep your computer from falling asleep. But maybe it's more... Why won't home. people... I mean, I assume people... I mean, if you have a job that needs to get done... The nice thing about working from home is you can get it done in however long a time it takes, right? And then you can go do whatever else. It shouldn't else. be, but bosses... Are we paying by the hour or are we paying that's for That's not what bosses are doing. There is, yeah, there's there's software now. It's in really fact, getting awful. I think yeah. if you look at the descriptions of these mass jigglers on, on uh, Amazon, you'll realize the word undetectable shows up in every single description. <laughs> undetectable <laughs> mouse mover. I think that tells you what this is for. No one will know. That you're, they might wonder why is his mouse just kind of jiggling like that? But <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of sad if you work for a, a job like that. By the way, uh, thank you to Scooter X who has posted in our Discord. Pokemon Go creator Niantic launches Bitcoin hunting AR game. I'm so confused. Uh, Wait, let me see. What? I gotta I gotta go to that. Yeah, URL. I gotta think that through. What is, what are you, how, what? Huh? Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to put it in my browser and find out. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. I have a, for some reason, Firefox, when I click a link in Discord, it, it complains. Get okay. Chrome. It squeaks at you? <laughs> no, it says, are you sure you want to go there? Yes. Trust this domain. Oh. And then Firefox you see, says, you hang out with paranoid people. I'm this already is what you running. Get. I'm not going to. Firefox is already running. To use Firefox, you must first close Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of zen, isn't it? If you wish to use Firefox, little grasshopper, you must first close Firefox. Here it is. Um, they must have. Uh, they've announced. They're partnering with Bitcoin. Rewards application fold to launch a Bitcoin hunting AR game. It's oh, it's out November 23rd. It launched yesterday. In the game, players will hunt Bitcoin and other prizes in the wild with their phone. Do they actually get Bitcoin? Players will be able to earn Satoshis, which, by the way, is the penny of Bitcoins. is the smallest possible denomination. But also win spins that could allow them to earn more, but won't. The rewards will appear on screen as 3D coins and other items. You know, I you know it might be as fun as uh, playing Pokemon Go. I'm gonna have to find this game. What's it called? Does it, does it say? I got a new game. I'm earning Bitcoin. Uh, I'm just gonna search for Niantic and see. Is anybody playing this? No, it's not. It's a bug in uh, Firefox and in probably my own Linux. I think somebody's saying, oh, you have an update. No, 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 no. Go to the terminal. Okay, yeah, you can fix it in the terminal. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know what? I bet you this is not available on iPhone, come to think of it. That's exactly the kind of thing Apple would say. Hey, where's our 30%? Uh-uh-uh. All right, let's take a little break. More to come. Lots of stories today. We got the change log still around the corner. But before we go much farther, I'd like to talk to you about userway.org. Uh, Userway is exactly, this is to me, this is exactly what a company that's trying to make a difference should be doing. So it turns out that according to the federal, in the U.S., the federal ADA law, and I bet there's laws worldwide about this, every website, without exception, has to be accessible. Every website is a public entity. Now, that's a challenge, of course, as anybody who owns a website starts thinking about it. How do you know what you need to do? Well, 
I've got a recommendation. It's very affordable. It's very easy. It's called UserWay. UserWay is an incredible AI-powered solution that tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG guidelines. And it's just a line, single line of JavaScript you put in your code. There's a plug-in for WordPress and other sites. It's very easy. You, and with that, UserWay can achieve more than an entire team of developers. And it, look, 1.4 million sites now use UserWay. Big businesses like Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx. But just because these are best-in-class enterprise tools doesn't mean you can't use it as a small and medium-sized business. In fact, it's very, very affordable. But the nice thing to know is when you take off, when you, when you grow, UserWay will grow with you. I mean, Coca-Cola can do it. You can. Uh, an accessible and compliant website's not just the right thing to do. It also makes business sense. There are millions of users who can't use your shopping cart or your nav menus or your forms, your registration forms. Millions of people who will require UserWay just to purchase your products. UserWay remediates weird, complex nav menus. It ensures all your pop-ups are accessible. It generates image alts. It writes descriptions for you. That's where the AI comes in and actually can understand the picture and tells people what it is. It fixes vague link violations, broken links. Make sure your website uses accessible colors while remaining true to your brand. You'll get a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed. Go to UserWay right now, userway.org slash twit. They've got a great scanning tool that'll tell you if your website's compliant. And if it's not, and I bet it's not, it's easy to remediate. You can use WordPress, Shopify, Wix, AEM, Sitecore, SharePoint. It's cost-effective, easy to add, and it really works. Just ask the voice of Siri, the world's most popular voice assistant, about UserWay. UserWay is trusted by more than 1 million websites and 60 million users with disabilities. Visit userway.org to learn how one line of code can make your website accessible. UserWay can make any website fully accessible and ADA compliant. With UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a great way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. That's, that's to me, that's the most important reason to do this. You go to userway.org slash twit, you'll get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Userway.org slash twit. Thank you for your support, UserWay. And thank you for supporting us by uh, using that address so they you know you saw it here. So somebody said it's, it, it is on an iPhone. Fold Bitcoin cashback rewards. No, 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 no. That's the, f that's just the fold account thing. That's not. That's not the game. I want the game. Uh, moving on. Cannabis orders now available on Uber Eats in Ontario. It's kind of great. Oh, perfect. Yeah. The grass and the munchies come together. Yeah. yeah. And then you order yeah. again because you want more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a, kind of a virtuous uh, cycle. Yeah. Yeah. FTC, this is really good. And this uh, article coming from the Neiman Lab. So let's give them credit because, of course, great supporters of journalism. Is it the end of click to sub subscribe but call to cancel? The FTC says no. that's Please. illegal. Yay. Yes, California did this and it was great. So I am glad that the FTC has done this. Uh uh, and the reason it's in uh, the Neiman Lab website is because a lot of newspapers, newspapers. do this. Yeah. A, a study of 526 news organizations found that only 41% make it easy for people to cancel subscriptions online. And, of course, you train your customer service reps in tactics to talk them out of it. And that's why you want them to call. Make it harder to cancel. Uh, the FTC says the practice is one of several dark, quote, Dark, they even know about dark patterns. Quote, dark patterns that track, trick or trap customers into subscriptions and it's straight up illegal. The FTC vowed to ramp up enforcement. Companies must provide an easy and simple cancellation process, including an option that's at least as easy as the one to subscribe. Yay, yay, yay. Wow. One click cancel. <laughs> wow, this, thank you, Lena Khan. This Lena Khan at it again. She uh, she really has her, uh, she's not a fan of big tech. To comply with the law, 
she says. But this isn't big tech. This is big media. Well, every, media. you know what? It's not just media. I mean, every uh, every subscription. This is one of the reasons. One of the only reasons I think the iPhone is is a is a superior platform to Android is that anytime you buy anything through Apple, it adds that to a list of subscriptions you can easily find on the iPhone, and it makes and you can cancel right there, and that's part of Apple's rules for subscriptions. And Ooh, um, that's I a, didn't even know that. That's a really good yeah. thing. I periodically go through it and cancel subscriptions. It's actually good for everybody because if it's easy to cancel, you're more likely to try it, right? Well, and mm. like I don't know about you, but I have subscriptions that I turn on and off basically. Yeah. On based on like a television especially. Yeah. But even stuff like fitness apps, you know, I get bored so I'm like let's do two or three months of Peloton and then let's switch over. You no, know, that's what they're afraid of. Churn is the worst this thing they're fighting, oh, right? Oh, it's the worst. I, 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 I'm old enough to remember in the industry when when um, presumed uh, renewal through your credit card came along, automatic renewal. That was a huge, yeah. huge revolution. So, but churn, okay, just thinking about it logically from a business perspective, if you think about churn for like a telco, it's a big deal because they've got to lay lines or give you hardware. Even a media publication has to say, hey, I've got X number of subscribers, thus I'm going to pay real money to print physical copies of the paper and mail them out, right? As you move to digital, turning things on and off is actually pretty easy and it's not expensive if your software works correctly. But your real cost... So then Go ahead, sir. Well, that's what I'm saying. So I understand the business model logic here, but the actual real costs of it are pretty low, which means eventually they will, unless there's a monopoly, they will move to doing that because there's no reason not to. Here's the Someone thing. Someone will make it easier. It's Tell not me. A, um, a a switch on and off. Uh, a, 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 what do you call it when you when you when you start a phone line? Um, connect, disconnect. Um, well, whatever. Yeah. So, uh, provision, uh, unprovision. Provision. It's not a provision question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, to use the jargon. It's a marketing question. Like, so how much do you think it costs to market to get a new subscriber to entertain weekly back in my oh, day? Oh, well, no, that's that's true. But right. even the cost of marketing is lower. Um, not necessarily. Because it's harder to get people. And... Um, it depends on what the cost of the item is. When I when I you know when I worked for Delphi Internet way back in the day, uh, the the subscriber acquisition cost was like one hundred eighty dollars. It was huge. Okay. Well, and and then yes, I mean I'm not saying I mean I get why people don't want people to stop paying the money every month, but right, I also right. get you know flipping things back on and off in the digital world is way different than flipping it back on and off in the physical world. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I yeah. Don't you're, think you're, our you're, cost in provision sense, that. you're right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, but yes, yes, there's marketing expense. There's, I mean, if you're a newspaper, there's all the journalists you hire. I mean, there's well, the content. We've got a good solution for production. that, actually. Uh, the New York Times had AI write the book review for a book that I don't think anybody wants to read The Age of AI and Our Human Future <laughs> by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, and Daniel Hootenlocker. And I'm thinking Hootenlocker probably did all the writing on this one. Uh, the, the, the reviewer. Kevin Roos, we Kevin all know, Roos. yeah, love him, said, after finishing The Age of AI, a new book about artificial intelligence by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, and Dan Daniel Hootenlocker, I found myself unmoved by the prospect of reviewing it. I've read dozens of books about AI, and while the conceit of this one was intriguing, bringing together a 98-year-old diplomat... <laughs> And war criminal, <laughs> a former Google that was that was me. I added that a former Google chief executive and an MIT professor. The book itself was a fairly forgettable entry in the genre. So he got GPT three <laughs> to write it. <laughs> to write it, uh, I didn't know about this. Pseudo write S U D O write is a AI writing program that uses GPT three. I, I remember reading that OpenAI was reluctant to release GPT-3 because it was too good. I don't know if that's well, the case. Wait, wait, well, wait till you yeah, get that, to the first the cuts case. below. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it does this with the help of a supercomputer containing some 285,000 processors, a multi-layered neural network that ranks among the world's most powerful AI engines. In fact, 
It's even mentioned in the book, The Age of AI, as one of several promising technologies that are producing a revolution in... Wait a minute, he more, he's more like... Produce, no, no, boys, producing a revolution, a revolution in human affairs. So come over here, please. I pasted the first several paragraphs of this review into pseudo write and asked the AI to finish. Here's what it wrote. Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, and Daniel Hootenlocker. I just like saying his name. That's why I keep reading it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the Age of AI is a bold new book on artificial intelligence that will become a go-to guide for anyone who wants to understand this transformative technology. It's as if the AI knew. You know, it's like yeah, log... So this is about a B. AI be log here. rolling here. Yeah. <laughs> the authors have examined the full range of AI technologies from computer vision systems to natural language processing and written about them in a way that will appeal to both experts and lay people. I mean, honestly, it does sound like a human wrote this. Kind of a PR human. Add human? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the most inspiring aspects of this book is its scope. The authors <laughs> delve what a wonderful meaningless statement into the potential yeah. of AI in all areas of human enterprise. They describe the impact of AI in healthcare, economics, geopolitics, law, urban development, governance, journalism, the military, even the are, life sciences. Are we at a hundred words yet? <laughs> Do I have to keep going? Yeah, this, this sounds like what I used to write in high school. Yeah, it's so a high school paper. Like paper. Uh, uh, Kissinger, Schmidt, and Hootenlocker are not afraid to explore the darkest side of AI either. They are clear-eyed about the ways that AI could enable dictators to monitor their citizens and manipulate Ooh, some of my best friends. Yeah, to incite people to commit violence. Oh, that's interesting. Although AI is already making our lives better in many ways, Kissinger, Schmidt, and Hootenlocker, clearly GPT-3 enjoys his name as well, caution that it will take us as, as a species many years to create a system as powerful as we deserve. They so AI creates a bunch of meaningless blather. In the, in yeah, the they wisely suggest we not lose sight of the values we want to instill in this new machine intelligence. I, you know, look, it's got high, it got to a high school level. Yeah, it did. It Pretty did. good. Now, now read the earlier try. Oh. Did you read that? No, yeah, That's okay. hilarious. That was, that was the best try. On the yeah. first attempt, it spun out a series of run-out sentences that hinted GPT-3 stuck in some kind of odd recursive loop <laughs> <laughs> as an example the book which you are reading at the moment is a book <laughs> a book on a nook which is a book on a book which is a book on a subject which is a subject on a subject which is a subject on a subject <laughs> what yeah I love when it, it goes wrong it goes wrong so <laughs> hilariously it's dr seuss the book which you're reading at the moment is a book on a nook, which is a book on a book, which is a book on a subject, which is a subject on a subject, which is a subject on a subject. A few tries later, it seemed to give up on the task of book reviewing altogether and started merely listing the names of tech companies. Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, Baidu, Tencent, Tesla, Uber, Airbnb, Twitter, Snap, Alibaba, WeChat, Slack. Bootenbacher. <laughs> But it warmed up quickly, and within a few minutes, the AI was coming up with impressively cogent paragraphs of analysis, fr some frankly better than, says Mr. Roos, what I could have generated on my own. <sighs> well done, Kevin Roos. Well done. Yeah, well played. So so let's see. Did he, should he have been paid for writing that article if he had turned that in? And is it art if a journalist makes an AI write him a story? I'm it's art curious. because of the way he made it a very much more interesting story than a review of this dopey book would have been. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's where, he, that's the, that's the art. Uh, he says, finally, GPT-3 did not address the biggest question about the book, which is why it exists at all. <laughs> Kissinger, who was 66 years old when the World Wide Web was invented, is not a full-time AI practitioner, nor a particularly savvy parser of tech hype. Remember, he was on the board of Theranos. Um, so, anyway. Um, yeah, you know what? wasn't on the board of Theranos. I mean. <laughs> not me. I was not. Um, this kid, The trial is getting interesting now. I think uh, sh she is on, the, Elizabeth Holmes is on the stand this week. Yes, she has been. I haven't, have you followed the case? I haven't really. 
Yeah, you know, and it's gotten more and more damning as they've gone on. I mean, essentially, we were uh, told that the strategy was going to be because they separated the trials of Elizabeth Holmes, the founder, and the man who was at the time her, not only her paramour, but also ran the company, Sonny Balwani. Those trials were separated. His trials later uh, is next year. That it was thought that each trial would be each defendant blaming the other one. For, for everything. And it's kind of what happened is, you know, uh, but um, they, they've been bringing in a parade of people who are saying, well, they didn't put it in writing, but here's what they told me. And it was all BS. Finally, last week, um, they had the uh, recordings uh, for reporters interview with Elizabeth Holmes in which she repeated all of the lies and misdirections that she had told the investors. They got it on tape. So I think that's kind of blockbuster. Um, and she can't really say, well, it's Sonny's fault. He he said that, not me, because they got her on tape saying it. I'd be inter I haven't read her testimony yet. It'll be interesting to see what she says. Um, all I saw was the TikTok of her holding hands with her a current uh, romantic partner and her mother walking into the court and some guy in the background saying, you go, girl boss. That's uh, that was that's all I have. I don't know. Yeah. California. Go, <laughs> you go, girl boss. You tell him. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. California. So one of my favorite authors, Stacy Higginbotham, wrote a piece called The Unbearable Fussiness of the Smart Home, finally admitting what we've known for years. Tell that's, us. That's me. That's you. Tell us about your uh, tale of woe. Yeah, and we talk about how the smart home all the time is not smart enough, right? And I finally decided to, like, Break down Tell the I used truth. examples. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I, I talk about it being messy all the time. I mean, I don't, there's yeah, no don't, reason to don't. lie to people about that. Yeah. I don't sugarcoat it. About let me, let me um, give you but, uh, the smart home. This is one quote is like a cat. Mostly self-sufficient and nice to have, but also possessing a mind of its own that can lead to frustration and confusion for its owner. I think that's a perfect analogy. It and sometimes is. And it so pees I followed, on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, I followed things that broke in my house and as examples. And basically the whole point of this article is you are no longer buying hardware, even though you think you're buying oh. hardware. You're buying software. Yeah. And, and you're not only buying network software, services. you're buying independent or interdependent yeah. software and services from yeah. different vendors. Yeah. And it's it just constantly degrades. You cannot get a device that's going to consistently if you hook it up to anything else, an update might break it. A new feature role might break it. All kinds of, you never know. And so I just kind of wrote this. I didn't think it would it's done very well. I I was kind of like, oh, fine, I'm just writing this cuz Well, I'm let me say off something. Man, only flights don't you work. got picked up 11 hours ago by Hacker News. 288 comments. All of them pretty much agreeing with you. Uh, a lot of reinforcement. I think, um, I, you know, there's always the guy said, well, I don't have those problems. But uh, yeah, there's all the, you know, I, there's a subset of people. There's the, well, this is why I never put any of this stuff in my house to right. begin with. There's right. the, you would never have this program or problem if you installed open HomeKit, source. Yeah, open source. Home Seer, what, yeah. pick, yeah. you know, Cedia, whatever, professional installer, whatever. Um, and then there's the people who are like, yeah, this this does suck and who actually recognize that it's a problem. And, I'll, and this isn't just a problem for like the smart home industry. It's a problem for consumers. It's a problem for manufacturers. And it's going to be a legal problem because we, like I said, Everybody's hardware, your car, your uh, your corporate, I don't know, manufacturing machines, they're all becoming software. And software has different ownership require or different requirements by the manufacturers, like different obligations for security and things like that. And it has a different product for the, it's a different product for the consumer. And we don't realize that. There's a good story actually this week from... Um, Ars Technica on people buying the Nordic track something oh, yeah. something treadmill. And hacking it, yeah. And hacking it. And then so Nordic they can track. Watch Netflix. They, <laughs> yeah, they they hacked it. They were like, this thing has a 32 inch screen on it. I love it. I'm gonna hack it. It's running base Android. We'll just sideload Netflix yeah, yeah. and YouTube and whatever we want. And 
apparently Nordic Track was like, you know what, we're going to update this. It's it's too easy to like sideload stuff. And maybe Nordic Track didn't realize it was breaking a critical functionality that people loved. Um, but Nordic Track didn't offer it as a formal functionality. So from their perspective, they're kind of in the clear and maybe they want to do a business model where they do a deal with YouTube right. for exclusive access. I mean, these are the sorts of things where a lot of the conflict about like the stuff we're buying today is conflicts about, is it hardware or software? So- Well, and more, even more, it's often you own the hardware, but you don't own the software. And right. so as a result, you don't really own the device. You don't control it. And and, and it's not yeah. just home automation. Everything's it's your car. that way. It's your car. Uh, it's your John yeah. Deere combine. My favorite comment in the Hacker News thread from Brian Rasmussen, very simple, there will come soft rains, which if you're a Ray <laughs> Bradbury fan, you know exactly what they're referring to. Um, is that from the Velt, or is that actually the name of the story? I'm trying to remember. You should tell everyone who doesn't know that story. Well, the Velt is a great example. Let's see. Oh, yeah. There Will Come Soft Rains is the story, and it's it's after the nuclear meltdown. There's nothing left except the automated devices, which continue to operate forever. <laughs> if you're not a Ray Bradbury fan, you got to read some... Uh, you got to read some Ray Bradbury. If you're not a Ray Bradbury fan, why not? Yeah, why not? Exactly. There will come soft rains. What a great, simple comment to add. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, look, the fact that you got not only picked up on Hacker News, but 288 comments shows that you touched a nerve. You definitely touched yeah. a nerve. This is something we're yeah. all experiencing, you know. Yeah. Pete Warden retweeted it, and I think he's just the best yeah. so he's he's the tiny ml dude at google and i nice love his worldview nice so so but for me it was a little bit of an antidote because you're always talking about how much you love your nano leaf elements and your your wemo remotes and stuff to know that it's just as bad for you as it is for me <laughs> it is like i have the only problem like i'm trying to think of the few problem free devices and and a lot of the problems come in like the nano leaf issue was an update that broke my system and i'm still waiting to get it fixed the wemo stuff is that is like a weird ghost between Google and Wemo. They have like these, this, I, I think I called it this ebb and flow of like working and non-working. That's so hilarious to me. I just, it's like living, uh, you know, in a haunted house. Cause like sometimes at eight, my lights will turn off like they're supposed to, but sometimes they won't. And I never know what's going to happen. Apparently enrages your husband. <laughs> oh yeah. He, he gets, he's just, he's like, Hey G turn on the plants. <laughs> Turn on the plants. <laughs> Stacy, it's broken. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's just not working this week. He's like, oh, this I was week. like, give it a couple days this week. That's my favorite. <laughs> it does. It does. It, it does. It's, 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 it's so fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, actually, you know what? We're going to give you a reward, Stacy, for your excellent article. Because there are now some pretty strong rumors about the Pixel 6G. And it's oh wait be. no, no six A I mean I, do you what did you I buy what did you five. buy oh I bought a five on Swappa and oh, you know what how much I was it, it. Oh, I good oh it was like uh, four hundred dollars oh maybe three there you go and it has a I headphone think it was 400 jack four hundred all in which is something, it has a headphone jack yeah because the rumors of the Pixel six A say no headphone jack but it is smaller and lighter but probably not as small and light as a five A. So well, I if had I known, but I had to return my Google. Google has the crappiest return policy on phones. Oh, it's 15 days. Yeah. So I had to, you know, I, I wanted something. So, so you're happy. And with I got a, a cool camo case. Look at that. Good. I was like, I'm like, I'm like a finance bro. For now. those who missed last week's episode, the self titled Princess Floppy Wrists episode. Uh, Stacy did not, did not, and I meant that in only the most loving way. I, I did not take it as I, I thought it was no, hilarious. no. She, yeah, you laughed, you laughed heartily at it. Yes, I, uh, I enjoyed the princess. I was like, yes. Uh, Stacy was not happy with the weight and heft of her Pixel Six Pro. I'm glad to see that you found something good. And you know, I think honestly, except for the cameras, they're probably pretty comparable. 
And you do. Yeah. And I'll look at the six. Maybe I'll get that. And, you know, my daughter can have the The five and she won't have like, I just, I don't love this. I wasn't as like, I was genuinely excited to upgrade to the pixel six, but no, I mean, it was, I mean, this is not exciting. It's functional because my other phone was kind of getting real laggy. So. I'm amusing myself with visions of why Stacy couldn't be Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wave. I can't wave. Now, you were having trouble, Jeff, with your Pixel 6 and your Android yeah. Auto. Yes. So I, I and I was, I'm, I'm honored. I am absolutely honored that I was the celebrity letter of the week on All About Android with its host, <laughs> Vader G. Krebs. Um, ooh, ooh. Um, so and the beard's working. He's got, he's got a little beard. He's, got he's doing Movember it's, it's where nice you grow, uh, you, you grow, yeah. uh, you grow a beard to, to support men's yeah. testicles. Yeah. yeah, I want to see it. We, we need a selfie. So Jason, put a selfie up, will you? Um, so oh. the problem is... Or you can just I, watch I, All About Android. Well, Android. I was going to say, I want to see it at the end of the month. I want to wait till, you know, next week. Well, it's pretty darn close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we only got another week. There. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a lot more. Uh, <laughs> okay. Killing. Well, I was like, maybe there's more growth. <laughs> Not unless he takes a lot of hormones between now and Monday. What did Major um, G Krebs okay, so- wear? Did Krebs wear? Did he wear a beret? He was a no, hipster. I don't think so. He had, he had, a, he had a goatee. Right. So. He was, of course, we're talking about Doby Gillis, which is a show yeah, even a too old for Nobody me. Gets, yes, yeah, but I loved it. Yeah. Um, um, so, so all right. And it was it was well, anyway. Gilligan who played Maynard G. Krebs. Yes. And uh, there is a certain <laughs> certain similarity. <Celebrity. laughs> oh, it was bongos. That's right. Uh, you need some bongos, uh, Jason. That would do it. And a torn sweatshirt. Yeah, torn sweatshirt. Work. Energy <laughs> Krebs used to say that all the time. Work. This is this is what network television thought of hippies or beatniks. Yeah, exactly. Really. Beatnik. Beatniks. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Moving. Oh, anyway. So my, wait, wait, wait. wait. We Sorry. Need my phone. Phone. We got to talk to you. I need help talk here. about your I need Android. Help. So I, in response to you. Yeah, yours was no good. You had nothing. <laughs> I pointed out that an- Android Auto did not work. If you have a VPN, or I was using NextDNS, if you had a VPN of any kind turned on, uh, or ExpressVPN, so I turn it off and it works just fine. I even sent you a proof of concept picture uh, to rub my nose in to it. To rub your nose much. in it, but maybe that's because I have a Ford. I don't know, but it doesn't. So others are reporting these these There's problems. There's lots of problems, and and so so what's happening is. Um, it'll recognize the phone. It'll recognize there's Android Auto. But when I click on Android Auto on the on the head unit on the car, it do, it, it doesn't do anything. It can't get anything out of the phone. I think is what's happening. Hmm. Um, the phone's not responding, and so nothing happens. And Ron said that that what he had heard on all about Android, he'd heard that um, uh, there were there were issues with lots of different cars, and um, I also heard in Twitter that maybe it's the cable. Uh, it's very persnickety. Oh, Google has a problem here. that could be. Google has a problem. So I'm using wireless uh, Android Auto. I can't. There's no such thing. Yeah, yeah, you have to have it. But uh, maybe that's why I can use it and you can't. So I'm trying to be calm here and and not have a cycle. Are you using the cable that came with the phone? Try that. Uh, that's, it's, it's C to C. Oh, and you don't have C in your car. Oh, there's the. Oh, you have it's a yeah, it's a car. So Detroit's about forty years behind. That's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I had I had had a hellish week trying to get my. my, I I decided to upgrade my FiOS. My FiOS was working. It was working beautifully for a whole. Oh man, these tweets burned my eyeballs. They were so angry. I mess with it. And I finally, a nice guy named Frank was here for four and a half hours. This is point, Stacey, this goes to your point, I think, about the persnickiness of these things. You know, it was like one old um, uh, 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 splitter that wasn't up to the right number on it, and that caused two to go down, and something else caused others to go down. And he said, yeah, these are a lot touchier. Set-top boxes are the worst computers ever created. They're just awful. So anyway, so I got through all that. And I said, I can't take another crisis. I'm just going to tell myself to be calm. I can still use my car. I can still use my phone. I hope Google will fix it. Zen breath, Jeff. Zen breath. So I'm pissed about it, but I'm I'm trying not to get upset about it. Uh, and guess. all about Android was, really? was helpful. Let me know I wasn't alone. Oh, I could, I'm, I'm, I'm a hair 
hair trigger away from a psycho fit, but I'm trying not to. <laughs> Here, okay, Jason I was has, like, you seemed pretty Jason upset. Jason has tweeted a picture of his um, incipient beard. <laughs> <laughs> Nascent. Nascent beard, that's oh, the word. Oh, it came in just, it came in so nicely down there. It's that's so really cute. Almost. Yes. yes, it's so cute. But it, but it is Bader G. Krebs, right? Uh, yeah. He's a beatnik. A little gray in there too, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Oh, no, Jason's a good looking fella and uh that's a nice beard. He said his wife is saying at the moment of the tick of the clock into the new month, it's going. Oh, yeah, that's why I can't do it cuz Lisa wouldn't it won't let me. Just full out won't let me. Which is fine. Cuz I think in my business, honestly, it's better not to have a beard cuz you want to you want to get as much expressiveness. You know, you want all the emotions and no i think some people like if you have a bad chin you want a beard well there's cause not a bad yes. chin i'm sorry if you have a weak chin i think my chin's good so I so am i probably. accused of having a weak chin or not being expressive enough right now well mm, yeah, yeah i mean a goatee isn't too bad because it's, it's still a lot of your face is exposed but uh, i also think it's a strong statement like uh, uh to... well just it's just a statement it's like people go goatee and so I'm trying to be as neutral as possible. <laughs> right? I enjoy. Goatee. No, don't you make, don't you look at a, somebody, I mean, when you see somebody with a beard, you pigeonhole them. That's a Santa Claus. That's a Maynard G. Krebs. You did it yourself, Jeff. It's, uh, there's something, because a beard, you the see the beard. of love and fun. <laughs> All right. Uh... Did you see the actually the Android police story that said your Pixel 5 could have been a contender if they'd only had the Tensor chip they had planned. They had planned to put the Tensor chip in the 5. Yeah. But they it wasn't ready. And uh, according to Marquez Brownlee, uh he had conversations with people at Google saying the company had been working on Tensor for a long time. They wanted the Pixel 5 to be the first <laughs> phone to launch with it. But because of COVID-19 and supply chain obstacles, this would explain why they were a little bit lackluster in promoting the Pixel 5. Right. They were right. a little disappointed. Yeah, that that well, they had the put dog a, ate our homework. Yeah. They had I to put know, a Snapdragon yeah. into it at the last minute. So that, 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 that kind of explains, because there was definitely this lack of energy around the Pixel 5. Like. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even excited to have it. So, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm just like, eh, it's a phone. I mean, it, but phones are pretty utilitarian now for me anyway. I used to get excited, but who cares now? You yeah, know? yeah. yeah. Uh, should we do a change log? Because we're getting close to the it end is. of this program. It's pretty <laughs> light this turn. week, according to Maynard G. Krebs. So just a word of warning. Play the drums. <laughs> The Google Change Log. Mac Rumors rejoices that as soon as Google Messages is updated, which should be happening soon on most Google phones, no longer will you get that kind of pathetic user liked your message. You'll actually get a happy go lucky thumbs up, an emoji reaction. We're starting to see it already in uh, Google Messages. If you get an iMessage from an Apple user, and so it won't it won't quote the entire message anymore. It still does a message, but it will add the thumbs up. It'll look a lot more like it looks on the iPhone. On the iPhone, so what? These are message reactions. So I have the message, and if I, you know, a lot of times people say, "Well, I'll see you at five. I don't respond to it. I just put a thumbs. I long press it, put a thumbs up on it. I guess I could, I could give a thumbs up to uh i don't know my my mom saying let's facetime now she's gonna be she's gonna be really confused by this um <laughs> i'm gonna do a thumbs up right now because she's on an iphone you didn't she's, call me yeah i know so, hey, what is this? you didn't call well, you, you never said we were gonna facetime so um, i did facetime her yesterday but that's what this message is from so Actually, there's I'm a little she facetimes right now i'd love to meet mom. oh wouldn't that be funny oh you haven't met her oh yeah yeah she's great uh, so now it puts that thumbs up on there, which is a way of acknowledging it. And it used to be uh, on Android messages. If it was an Android person, they'd see, you know, something like Leo liked your message in text. No, what it would do is it would say heart and then it would repeat the entire message. Oh, it would. Yeah. Oh. It's really irritating. Oh, yick. So now it's going to have uh, the thumbs up. 
but it will also pop up, which is unfortunate, a message saying translated from I iPhone, <laughs> which is really annoying. <laughs> so uh, Google giveth and Google taketh away. Black Friday deals now live in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Australia. Uh, these are the deals we'd actually talked about. Um, I don't know. I can't uh, speak to the uh, Australian deals, but some really, really good deals. In fact, I'm very tempted. We talked about this last week to get this uh, Google uh, Nest speaker because uh, there's $50 off. Um, the Nest Hub Max, which I really like, is down $50 as well. So these are all Black Friday, Black Friday deals uh, at the Google Store. 30 bucks, 50 bucks. I think this is fairly good savings on a lot of Google things. Yeah. Did I mean, I was kind of sad. Like, had I bought my Pixel and kept it, I would have been like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, earbuds or something, right? Now it looks like you get... You got an extra pair if you want them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I took those. I canceled my earbud order since I returned the phone. Right. Right. They they sent me the earbuds before I got the phone. Oh, Aww. so then I wasn't allowed to return it when I turned the phone. The Nest, I think the best I didn't return deal, the phone anyway. The Nest Audio, which is normally a hundred dollars, is down to sixty bucks. Nest Thermostat down a hundred bucks. There's some good deals. Those are some good deals if you want those particular. Things. Yeah, I wouldn't run out and buy them just because you got a deal on them. But that's the problem with Black Friday yeah. deals in general. If you're, well, it's like okay. Well, no, I'm not going to talk about this. Google's I've already been made fun of for my slippers, so. Oh, I'm not on. making fun of your slippers. I no, celebrate you, you, your you slippers. You had a cult of people following you in <laughs> little fuzzy leather things. LL Bean Happily. should send us a check for all the slippers they probably sold because of you. Yeah. Okay. Google Stadia. I'm not sure I'd buy into Stadia right at this moment. Two years old. They're celebrating with uh, inexpensive or free hardware. It, it's really software, and it might brick. Yeah. yeah. But if it's free, I guess, sure. Um, you can now buy the Stadia Premier Edition hardware kit, which actually comes with the Chromecast Ultra, which is good, and the Stadia controller for just $22.22 because it's their second anniversary. Uh, or get one free when you purchase a $30 or higher game in the Stadia store until November 29th. I, you know, I'm not sure I could recommend buying Stadia at this point. It seems like it's uh, struggling a little bit. And I did do this. You can pre-order the second generation Pixel stand. It won't ship until next month. Um, I actually ordered it. I have the old Pixel stand. Uh, this is $79. It's designed for the Pixel with a custom stand UI on the screen of your phone. So you can control audio, adjust smart home devices, and at the bottom, you can select quiet or performance charging modes. The, the, the stand actually has a fan in it to keep it what? cool. Yes. While it's doing fast charging. It looks kind of oh, nice. Did you see that the, is it the Pixel 6 doesn't charge at 20 or at 30 watts? Yeah, it's, it's 22. A slower charge? Yeah. 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 Well, that's what you were complaining about, Jeff. Or no. It was Paul Thorat. No. Paul Thorat was complaining no. about it. That was, that was one complaint I didn't have. Yeah, he was complaining, oh, it takes two whole hours to uh, charge up. And it's like, oh, gee, however will that's you actually, live? That's actually, I mean, that's kind of it's a long pretty time. fast. Well, it's long compared to things like the OnePlus, I guess. Super Dude, fast. my Pixel, I was using the Pixel 2 because that's the oldest phone we have. Well, because there was like a two-day lapse between Pixels. Um, man, that thing charged at no time. Probably because there wasn't much going on in it. <laughs> yeah. It's a smaller battery. It's good, though, because the battery is so yeah. old. It was like, you have used me for an hour. We're back at zero. The uh, the new Pixel stand has, uh, and I'm quoting Google here, approximately 39% recycled <laughs> materials. Why would you say approximately and then give such an oddly precise uh, percentage? Because we're probably wrong about it anyway. Yeah. So now I'm wondering, well, what is it really? Um all right. I always order these. You should I say why. we think. We think. Something like. We hope. Something like Maybe. would be good. Yeah, it only goes up to 23 watts for uh, compatible Pixel phones. That's fast, though, for uh, wireless charging, which is wireless charging. Much slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the wired is not, yeah. Apparently, don't you shouldn't buy one of those fancy high wattage 
charger uh, wall warts Charging because cables. you won't get the benefit yeah. of it uh, on a Pixel, yeah. apparently. And that is the Google Change Log. Mm -hmm. Samsung is going to build mm -hmm. its factory in... Taylor, Texas. Tyler, Texas. 17. Taylor. 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 Oh, Taylor's not Tyler. No, Tyler's by Dallas. Taylor's by Austin. Oh, okay. You know it. Uh, I do. <laughs> seven, you know it well. Actually, that's a good place. Austin's a tech corridor. $17 billion chip making factory. Yeah, it's only like 20 or 30 miles from Samsung's Austin fab. Oh, uh, so they already yeah. have a fab down there. Yeah, they have a 300 millimeter one where they mix Exynos chips, actually. It's a, oh. it's a good fab. I wonder what they're going to do in this it's one. Probably make 300 more, millimeter more other Exynos fancy chips. chips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, our, uh, our longtime sponsor, Casper, which had a kind of not a great IPO and the stock's been going down, they've decided to go private. They're buying back all their stock. Um, <laughs> hmm. uh, when it listed, it sold its stock for $10 to share rising above $15 per share early, then going down to $3.18 a share. More recently, they're offering $6.90 a share. That's a 94% premium to the closing price on November 12th. Um, I'm rooting for them. I love my Casper mattresses. Uh, and I they were, they were I think, the first mattress in a box company. They've been uh -huh. advertising for a long time uh, with us. Um, the, I, you know, the problem is it got to be a very crowded category and, well and uh, it's a pretty niche market i mean well you know if you go down main the streets of main street usa any town usa you'll see mattress store after mattress store. oh yeah so there must oh, be yeah, some money in that so people don't buy mat apparently mattresses are somewhat of an impulse purchase for a lot of people what? so <laughs> they actually design there's a whole article on this where <laughs> You're like, you're like, oh, I need to get a mattress. And then you see one and you're like, oh, I guess today's a good day. So they oh. try to stagger them so they're easy to, act. they're like McDonald's, right? Yeah. You got to be able to enter and they're exit like a easily. Starbucks. You want to quickly run in and get a mattress. Yeah. So it's, I think it's weird, but I sure, I guess. <laughs> I just don't feel like it should be an impulse purchase, but okay. That's just well, me. impulse is probably, it's just like you don't plan to go to the mattress store. You're yeah. like, you need a mattress, you'll deal with it. You know, you don't usually break your mattress. You're just kind of, it, it's a feeling that grows over time. And then this guy named Jeff Jarvis put a poll up on Twitter. He said, the New York Times treats the iPhone as a luxury. I hate to break it to them, but I think many people would say that these days a subscription to the Times is a luxury. It costs you $1,000 a year for the New York Times? If you go full yeah. rate to get home delivery, not where I am yet. Wow. That's why so I the, just the, get the Times Sunday itself Times. Was, was saying that what's the real cost of upgrading your phone? $1,000. Oh, well, that's, that's what a subscription costs here. Yeah, but I'm with the New York Times, you get out. a newspaper every day. But you only get it one for one year at that rate. Yeah. My phone lasted for four years. Oh, uh, very good point. How's that poll going? Oh, it's, there's, it's stupid, but I just do it to be obnoxious. <laughs> Which is more just of a angry. necessity, a phone or a newspaper? Well, clearly a phone. It's got to be, yeah, a 90% phone. Yeah. 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 It's, I think, Jeff. Well, of course, I, I stacked the deck in the way I worded the question. You're, of host, you're hoisting. You're, you're being hoisted by your own petard because you really want people to buy newspapers, don't you? That is your I do, but business. I don't think that attitude is going to get us free. Well, that's a good point. But thank you to the New York Times because they're the only place I saw this obituary for a, a rebel who founded Silicon Valley and a name I did not know. He did not get the credit he deserves. Jay Last died at the age of 92. He was one of the seven who left Shockley to form Fairchild Semiconductor. And look at these guys in their, oh, in their white oh shirts and their black ties. Gordon Moore, Sheldon Roberts, Eugene Kleiner, later Kleiner Perkins, Robert Noyce, Victor Greenwich, Julius Blank, uh, Gene Herney, and Jay Last on the far right there. He passed away uh, this week at the age of 92. Ripe old age. That's a good age to, to make it to 92. One of the founders. The traitorous eight, they called them in 1960 when they, uh, when they left uh, Shockley. Shockley, who invented the transistor. 
and then later became a and won a Nobel Prize for it. Noyce invented the transistor. Ah, oh, that's interesting. He shared. Hold on. Shockley shared the Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor. So okay. I don't know who the other person was. And what did Kirby do? <sighs> Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby. I don't he was. Know. He did something with transistors. <laughs> well, a quick perusal of the Wikipedia. <laughs> Hello, Wikipedia. <laughs> say he's an American comic book artist. <laughs> oh wait, maybe I'm thinking of. Okay, hold on. Kilby? No. Oh, that's somebody else. That's oh, a physicist. I, yeah, that's well, a spy. Yeah, Kilby. Yeah, Philby. No, that's Philby. Philby. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. All I know is these guys: Moore, Roberts, Kleiner, Noyce, Greenwich, Blank, Herney, and Blast. Uh, the oh no, Jack, Cl Jack, Kilby. Kilby. Yes. yes, with Robert Noyce built the first integrated circuit. And oh, he shared I the see. Nobel Prize with... Ah, okay, see, and they I'm, were at I'm Texas I'm Instruments in 1958 yes. when they, along with Robert Noyce, created the integrated circuit. Kilby, we've talked about, because we were talking about last week, the 50th anniversary of the 4004. He was the inventor of the handheld calculator. Yeah, we talked oh, about... Oh, that's right. Yeah, we talked about Kilby, actually. Um, so, yes, not Kirby. <laughs> uh, this is hard. Anyway. Close, close. It, we're at that stage, you know, where a lot of these original uh, creators are uh, are passing on. Look at this. The Fairchild Semiconductor Lab in 1960. One computer historian said there was nothing more important than Fairchild Semiconductor to the Silicon Valley experience as we know it today. The Trader uh, Estate created transistors. Who are, who are those women in there? Yeah, they're the ones really doing the work, right? <laughs> Only women are clean enough to be in our lab. The guys are out there smoking cigarettes, like waiting for the baby to be born. Um, so, uh, I want a gift of that eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Dr. Last's death, Gordon Moore is the last surviving member uh, of the traitorous eight. Of course, he was the creator of the Moore's Law, uh, which we are still kind of, still still kind of true, although rapidly wearing out. Mm, yeah, we're, we're kind of, we're at the, I, I don't care what- The number of transistors on a processor will double every 18 months. Now, I have to say the new Apple M1 chip is more than just a processor, but it has 57 billion transistors. I don't know. Is, are we going to see 114 billion transistor processor in two uh, in a Does year and a half? Does it matter? Not it's... at this point, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. Oh, oh should we mention Gordon, uh, I mean, um, Rupert, taking a swing at Google and Facebook? Yeah, just more of the same. It's but just yeah. another week, another swing. Yep. Are you watching Succession? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, oh I am. I oh. finally started. It's still not as, it's it's okay. I don't love it. Okay, when you get to last week's watching. episode, which is three years and six episodes in, two years and six episodes I, in, you will I'm, see. I'm most is, the way through it. The, the, the current episode is the payoff for the entire two and a half years. It is the best episode of television I've ever seen. Wow, I've only started. Right, I'm, wow. Yeah, I've got 20 minutes left. I was kind of like, ugh, there's, I'm just so sick of I know them people hate them because they're thing. all awful. And I know there are these periods where it's like, you're still worried about the shareholders meeting? Come on, get off it. But this, this most recent one where they're picking the next president, and that's what made me think of Rupert Murdoch, is fascinating. And it's, and it's got some of the most, the funniest, most trenchant writing and television ever. Jesse Armstrong's a genius. It's, it's fantastic. In fact, I've watched it twice now, and I'm still missing bits of it. Yeah, I tend to watch now the episodes twice. Yeah, because there's the way lines. And, that, and, the, and in the uh, Succession TV Reddit, they say turn on the turn on the closed captions because whoever's writing the closed caption catch catches all the little sotto voce slights huh. and jabs that I you don't even hear. And so it's like a third script. You gotta you gotta watch it twice, then watch it a third time with the captions turned on. It's really wild. We watch everything with the captions. Yeah, turned on. yeah. Because I got a kid. Yeah. Because yeah. So Shiv and her husband, do you do you, do you get that one? 
Tom Wamsgans, <laughs> <laughs> Shiv's Midwestern uh, long, tall drink of water, uh, is rapidly becoming my pick for the Emmy Award. He is his, the actor uh, who's British, he and Greg, cousin really? Greg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Shiv is Australian. Yeah. If you, <laughs> Tom Wamsgans is my absolute favorite. His, the actor is Matthew McFadden. And he, I'm telling you, season three, episode six, just hold your horses till you get there and watch his expressions, watch his, listen to his lines. There is some of the, I don't want to, no spoilers, but some of the best writing on TV. It's incredible. I just, it blows me away. Aaron Sorkin times 10. Oh, well, that's not hard. I know. Yeah. <laughs> early Sorkin. I mean, the West Wing was Early great. Sorkin. Westbridge, West, West, West Wing was great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, it's but it's like that, early no. Sorkin, even better. Okay. Even better. You will love some of the lines in there. You will just love it. And it and it really does remind you of uh, of Murdoch. Uh, the hero of succession is Logan Roy, who's a Scottish entrepreneur who started a media empire, which includes a TV network called ATN that has certain resemblance to some network that uh, is very popular right now. And uh, ATN is so important, so powerful. Basically, he gets to pick the next president, having destroyed the current president. <laughs> I just wish I could remember some of the lines. They're so good. Anyway, I don't want to spoil it. Enjoy. Uh, let us take a break and then come back because you, too... I, I I forgot to mention, Sam was here. You may have said, "Well, where, where, where's where's Aunt Pruitt?" Well, he's on vacation because it's Thanksgiving. I think he said it last week. We should have said that. Good. Week, I yes. should have mentioned it. Yeah, he he did say it last week. He said he'd be sitting on the couch. Yeah, he's. he's I hope he's not watching. <laughs> Hi, Aunt. Hope he's enjoying oh. some. Oh no, South Carolina it, hospitality. Our show today brought to you by Andella. Oh, when I talked to these guys, I just got it. I thought, this is so great. They're a global talent network with a mission to connect brilliance to opportunity. Brilliance is global, but opportunity isn't. And you will find there are some tech talent out there so good, so good, and Della gives them the opportunities. Look, your company these days is expected to move faster than ever before to stay ahead of the competition. But how do you find the time to both build and onboard an amazing engineering team that'll get you where you need to go? This is where Andela can help. They are the world's first talent network connecting innovative companies like yours with top-tier vetted engineers so you have more time to focus on your core business. They use expert technical recruiters, proprietary matching algorithms, they connect you with developers who are the best in the business, enabling you to accelerate productivity, drive revenue, scale your business. And I, and I mean, the bottom line is brilliance is evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. And there are very talented people who are dying to work for you. And Della finds them with a rigorous vetting process which means it's easy for you. Their hiring process is quick and efficient for you, but they maintain the highest quality admission standards, so you're getting top quality engineers. Global talent, too, at your fingertips. Companies that limit themselves to hiring locally are at a severe disadvantage. With Andela, you could tap into their pool of highly qualified talent from around the world, cut your hiring timelines down from months to days. And the ramp-up times are very efficient. Companies obviously have to do more with less these days. Justify ROI consistently. When you hire Andela engineers, you can expect they'll be efficiently onboarded, ready to deliver value for your team within days. And these engineers, by the way, are not just part-time support. They're fully embedded into your organization. And they arrange it so there's at least five hours of overlapping working hours. So it's not like, oh, they're working at night, you're working in the day. No, there'll be at least five hours of overlap. I'll give you an example. A company called Mindshare, you might know, and partnered with Andela to hire 10 new digital experts, including, I mean, top-of-the-line data scientists, machine learning specialists, analysts, developers. Uh, the executive director and head of business intelligence at Mindshare says, quote, as we continue to enhance the Synapse platform, time to value is very important. Andela is a good partner in helping us identify the right talent that is fit for different purposes. It's time to tap into a wider talent pool. Stop competing with the major tech companies. Spend less time interviewing 
you are going to find amazing talent through Andela. Go to A N D E L A, andela.com slash four dash companies, F O R dash companies, to schedule a complimentary consultation and get a two week no risk trial with their vetted technical talent. You can actually try them for two weeks. Andela.com slash four dash companies. A N D E L A dot com slash F O R dash companies. Uh, do use that though so they know you saw it here. Very important. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen, if you go to the website, all the companies that use Andela Talent, including Casper, by the way, and others of our sponsors like Jamp. Andela is really doing something uh, remarkable. And as, as you look into it, I think you'll see what a great. Uh, boon this is both to your company and to the engineers and the talent from all over the world are giving a chance to andela.com slash four dash companies time for stacy's pick of the week well i just learned about pie caking but that's not actually my pick pie caking what's pie okay, caking it is it cake and Google pie pie it's a pie baked in a cake. So really, it looks more like the <laughs> pie filling baked into the cake. Oh. What cr but crust yeah. inside a cake would be a great thing. Oh, though. look at that. That's a pumpkin Eight. pie inside oh, all right. a Sold. cake. Sold. Yeah. So, I mean, given the holiday, I you know what? I'm going to make that my pick and check, keep my device the next week. Keep that device. Make week. some pie yeah, cake. Serve it. Because, man, I don't have time to bake it for Thanksgiving, but... But now I gotta try. <laughs> Kelly Rippa said, "Pie cake is pretty much the greatest thing that's happened to me besides the birth of my children." <laughs> look at look at this one from Gold Belly. <laughs> it's too late to get it for Thanksgiving, but uh, what is that? Pecan you could pie, get it pumpkin for, pie. Like, yeah. And what's the top? It's the turducken of cakes. The epic four-in-one layer dessert led to a pumpkin puree shortage in New York when it was invented in 2014. Created by renowned pastry chef Zach Young, the pie cake and <laughs> is a favorite of celebrities. Uh, and this is actually, I guess, Gold Belly is selling Zach Young's pie cake and 99 yeah. bucks for a cake. Well, sure. But you're getting the but pie with it. But it's cake and, and pie. And it's coming in the mail. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, this is I wish they'd tell holidays. me what kind of pies are in this pie cake. And I see the pumpkin. Looks like is a that, spice is a, cake. Is that a pecan at the bottom? It looks like pecan and looks like there's apple pie on the top. Man, that looks good. Pie cake. And yeah. <laughs> Call so, your yeah, so that's now. my pick now. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Gold Belly has a whole pie cake and bake shop. There's also a Christmas pie cake and. That looks like red velvet. Red velvet? Yeah. That, that looks like a heck of a lot of food coloring. <laughs> oh, boy. How do you make red yeah. velvet? So you're red? welcome, y'all. Uh, the red <laughs> is not red dye number three unless you're taking a shortcut. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Red velvet cake is cocoa powder. What is it, powder, beets? Usually. Yeah, cocoa powder. No, it, cocoa it's powder. Cocoa powder interacts it's not really with the baking soda, the alkalinity soda. of the baking soda and the cocoa powder interact to create a red kind of a thing. Oh, science. Yeah. science. Oh, you got to love science. Yeah. Ooh, this, uh, this, uh, this one. They tell you what, what's in the, the Christmas pie cake and pecan pie, eggnog cheesecake, and red velvet cake layered together with amaretto buttercream and topped with a sweet and tart cherry pie filling. Oh, that's a heart attack and a cake. Heart attack, we call it. But well, the shipping's free. <laughs> yeah, for 99 bucks. Can, you I, can, can, I, can I order some marijuana? I love that? it. They offer four interest-free payments of twenty four seventy five. <laughs> <laughs> take pay it off take, that cake from take, Christmas. Take out a loan for that pie cake and <laughs> uh, Mr. Jarvis. How about a number? Oh, I got all crappy ones this week, but so I might as well go with the Thanksgiving thing with the 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 now traditional Google search Thanksgiving casserole, which tells me I have to leave my state because I hate broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to unpack this. This is basically uh, side dishes by state. Is that right? Yes. Okay. The search resists. Yes. <laughs> My other favorite here. So, so New Jersey is broccoli, along with New York, and and Massachusetts. 
the, the amazing one is that the side dish the casserole in Pennsylvania is leftovers, which kind of seems like a time machine. <laughs> leftovers. I'm trying to figure that it's out. It's a nice covered dish. California, they say Mexican corn. That, now, this is not just made up like, oh, you're California, you must like Mexican corn. This is actual Google searches. Yes. Well, and it's it's differentiated. Like most people in California probably search for like stuffing, but no, this is casserole. There's enough. So they call it oh, un uniquely searched Thanksgiving casserole. So I guess you'd right. have to say Thanksgiving casserole. Well, um, no, no. What happens? No, what happens is they look at like most people in California probably surf stuffing, but right. the most weird search thing that people search from California is oh. Mexican corn. But is stuffing That's a casserole? I, I just use be. that because everyone's stuff, sorry, sweet potato casserole. Okay. Whichever. Oh, it's all so good. mac and cheese here. You know what I had today? What? I went to Popeye's because I had to try the Popeye's. Oh, they're mac advertising their mac new. and cheese. Is it good? Is it cheesy? <laughs> cheese delicious? <laughs> cheese delicious. Yeah, wow. I had um, at the fanciest restaurant in Petaluma uh, the other night. We, we love this Central Market. I had cacio e pepe <gasps> with oh, a bucatini it? pasta. It was fantastic. They, they do a good microwave there? <laughs> yeah, straight from TJ's. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a feeling they made it from scratch. I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, oh, I don't, you know what? If I had, I think I might have that tonight. I think tonight maybe. Oh, maybe it's Cacio well, Pepe know, night. On top, on top of, of, of of Popeyes, though, that could be very bad for me. Wow, I don't know. So it, is that the ch the chief attribute of Popeye's macaroni and cheese is cheese? Well, they also it's it's you know it comes in the in the, your basic fast food cardboard thing, but somehow they get a baked crust on it too. Oh, probably they bake it. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say there's a broiler. So I mean, broilers you can broil just it. stick it under there, there for like you go. thirty broil seconds. Broil it, broil it, broil it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I should have come. I came. Um, I came empty-handed to this. You've party. been doing that for months. You have. You have not played along with this. Well, you've quietly I'll be frank, just stopped. Usually, I have a pick, and then I wait and see how long the show has gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I stop myself. I mean, I have picks, but uh, nothing yeah. I'm really uh, crazy about. I I've forgotten a lot of them. But almost every week, week, Jason will back me up. Almost every week, I have a pick. I put it in our. Whereas uh, I'm like sticking mine in at the last minute. Yeah, I just bad. I want to take like, a back seat to the brilliant people who uh, are on this show with me. And I oh do, yeah, and I oh do, yeah, nice try. No, no, Lazy I do. <laughs> I do. Thank you very much. That is what I am thankful for: is the great people I get to work with each and every week on shows like this. Not necessarily this, but like this. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I am grateful for both of you and the I whole. I am very team. grateful. Uh, knowing you, Jeff, uh, all these years has been a great pleasure. Uh, I just, I uh, think the world of you, uh, and Stacy. I know it feels like. I mean, you've been here years, but it feels like you're the new kid. Uh, you're just fantastic. You add so much to the show. Was, so. What a blessing to have gotten you to. to no join kids, us, No, you had yep. big shoes to fill. Gina yep. Trapani was. Uh, was a legend. Pretty awesome. Yep. But you have yep. absolutely yep. done it. And we thank you so much. You're not allowed I to I do have leave. big feet. Do you? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. We're a size 10. Really? Yeah. Really? I wouldn't have guessed like, that. It's, my husband and I have the same size shoe. Wow. I'm tall. Where do you get oh. your slippers? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Stacey Higginbotham is at Stacey. Do they, do they make them that big there at, uh, at LL Bean, Stacey? <laughs> you buy the, the men's wicked good slippers? I bet you do. Oh, uh, Lord. Stacey on IOT.com. You should listen to her podcast with Kevin Toffel. Subscribe to her newsletter. And, of course, check out the events. There's always something interesting going on. at Stacey on IOT.com. Jeff Jarvis is the director of the Town Night Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the... Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. I'm oh, sorry, they were on a cigarette Craig, break and Craig, we had to get them back. Craig, Craig Newmark. Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. I think for Christmas I am going to buy you the official Corral version of that. <laughs> buy it for Craig. Just for variety, yeah. Yeah, and, and share it with Craig because... 
It, he, he did he inspire the whole thing. It. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, he did. Uh, we do this week in Google every Wednesday. It's 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. I say that because you can watch us make it live at live.twit.tv. If you're watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv or in our Club Twit Discord, which is always great fun. They're, they're fabulous with the animated GIFs. Um, <laughs> Uh, and all sorts of other things. Uh, if you want to join Club Twitter, it's seven bucks a month. You get ad-free versions of all of our shows, access to the Discord. Uh, Stacy's book group, I hear, went really well. Actually, we should. Are you? We blew out the room, man. Yeah, we we Yay. had we had overflow. Uh, we figured out how to get more people in next time. And you're okay. still trying to decide what book. You're not going to do Murder Bots two for the next one. No, we, we, we want to open you up to more worlds. Um, so there's a poll. Yeah, I think we've got a week. It's a week-long poll. So uh, the it's between Autonomous, uh, Ken Liu's latest book of short stories. Autonomous is by um, Annalie Newitz. And then Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie. Um, and then whatever the, I don't think anyone's voted for it. So whatever the Ken Liu book is. <laughs> So if you're in the club, go to the Club Twit Events channel in the Discord, and there's a link there to the Stacey Higginbotham Book Club. Vote on the next book. It's a little uh, complicated. The way you vote is by clicking, I don't know, what do you do? You click a link. Keep going down. Is yeah, at the I'm, bottom? I'm trying you to, to get there. all the way to the very, very bottom of the, the conversation. Oh, my God. It's very long. Well, it just shows you there was a severe demand for this. Holy cow. Yeah, y'all, we had a lot of fun. Um, I'm trying to find that. Can you just search autonomous and then maybe we'll get there? Let's click, see. Click on the numbers at the bottom. Uh, uh, there it is. Oh. <laughs> I'm completely, you know what? We got to come up with a better way to do this. Keep going up. Yeah. To the top. <laughs> the middle. <laughs> All right, forget oh, it. This is if you not just gonna... if you go okay there if you is. search autonomous. There it is. I got it. It was a Dinobot poll, but it's stuck in the middle of the thing. I don't even know how you f you find it. So so right now we've got sixteen votes for autonomous by <clears throat> Annalie Dewitz. We interviewed her by... by the way about the book on triangulation. So nice. she's great. Yep. Um, Ancillary justice has seven votes. And The Hidden Girl and Other Stories by Ken Liu has five votes. But now so. we know that this poll is here. We have no way to find it. <laughs> I encourage you, if you can find it, vote. Okay. I think if you start here, try searching for Lecky. L-E-K-I-E. -E. 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 That's the and that should, oh, yeah, Now I'm all clear what to search for. <laughs> can you say it again? Well, okay. L-E-C-K-I-E. Uh, that works. That works. So there it there is on the right, see. under L E C K I E or Annalie Newitz. You probably could find it with Newitz or yeah. Ken Liu, the hidden girl. I just like that name. I want to try that. Anyway, there's you know, three choices. Yeah. The, the next, oh, you can't vote on this. You just, yeah, you, yeah, you can vote. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. I haven't found the right thing. Yeah, so you click, then you click the search result. It'll take you to that part. And then you click the icon at the bottom. <laughs> Jesus, could this get more confusing? Wait till you, wait till you try to unsubscribe to Club Twit. Then you're going to have some fun. So, uh, no. It doesn't require a phone call, but you have to juggle. <laughs> no, we actually make it easy. If you want to know more, go to twit.tv slash Club Twit. I think this was possibly the worst ad we've ever done for Club Twit. It makes me want to quit. To be honest with you, you get ad-free versions of all the shows, access to this guy, the twist you know, plus. It's too feed, much fun watching which, Leo screw up. Which that alone, <laughs> that is alone, to be there. worth the price of admission. And you do get things like the Stacy Book Club, which is actually on the Twit Plus feed. Uh, we're going to do Steve Gibson soon. Mary Jo Foley is next week. Ask me anything. So there's lots of great events inside the club. I think it's well worth your seven bucks, but I'm a little biased. Um, if you don't want to pay. It's fine, too. We have ad-supported versions of everything we do. You can get those at our website, twit.tv slash twig. Uh, or you can sp even subscribe in your favorite podcast client, and uh, you can get it automatically. Um, 
And uh, if you will, if you if you like the show, please leave us a nice five star review. If you don't like the show, just please forget about it. But if you like the show, five star review would be very helpful. We want to spread the word about the goodness that is this week in Google. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody! What are you doing for Thanksgiving, Jeff? Anything? Uh, my my father is here, so oh, nice. Jake is coming down, and, oh. and it's, it's good. The family's yeah, yeah. together. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna have about yeah. ten people. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're doing a ham and steak and uh, stuff like that. Grilling or I'm going to smoke the or... ham. I'm going to grill the steak, sous vide, and then grill the steak. Making popovers, which I, I just love. Ooh, love I know. Those. I, uh, I got uh, 12, two 12 cup popover trays. So I'm going to make Oh, I was wondering popovers. if you had the popover paste. Oh, you have to. Yes. Yeah. Have to. Well, yeah. 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 It's part of the fun. Stacey, I don't think you said, when I asked you the early part of the show, what uh, what are you making? Oh, I'm making chicken, green beans. Right, that you said, green beans, okay. Uh, uh, Gluten-free oh. green beans, which is one of the things people search for, or gluten-y green beans. How could you get gluten in a green bean? I don't know, but that's you know, one of the specific you, search. You could coat the them in flour and fry them. That's Fried green not beans a good are actually idea. really good. Oh, no, no, all right. no, no, they're, they're quite I make good. Mine with, ranch. I make mine with, oh, that does sound good, actually. I make mine with <laughs> slivered almonds, and then I sprinkle little crispy onions on the top. I do them in ginger and garlic. Ooh, that and, sounds good. Yeah, sprinkle sesame seeds that on them. My good. heritage, my Whatever. hillbilly heritage is to cook green beans. Believe it or not, cook green beans. We don't do this because my wife would kill me. Uh, well, no ham hocks for Ooh. like five oh, yeah. hours. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. If I, I had any they, ham they hocks, would fall apart. Yeah, but none I, of this crisp stuff. No. Soggy. Oh no, so they're so good when they're all crispy <laughs> and like flash fried. Oh, I've got to blanch the green beans. Oh this, God! Should have quick, a get chart. going. Green okay. bean, I got blanched too. I'm doing that tonight too. I'm making the popover <laughs> dough and I'm making a German chocolate cake because I won't have time tomorrow. <gasps> so got some work to do. Oh, I am so jealous. Oh, I make a hell of a German chocolate cake. Oh, Leo, Ooh, I'm I coming. Okay, German I don't care if you invite me to your house. When I'm in California, so I'm surprised. coming. And I the want only cake. problem is because that icing, that is sweet, but I'm making yeah. a double boiler with condensed milk and. And uh, if I want to make it less sweet, I put in pecans and uh, shredded coconut. The, the recipe calls Ooh. for sweetened. I use the best foods uh, recipe for the icing. But I use a listener's recipe for the chocolate cake, which has a little bit of coffee in it to give it a nice little kick. It's very delicious. Ooh. Are you making the world's best mashed potatoes tomorrow? Yes. Oh, poor In Stacey. my thermo mix. Can't have them. Yes. Yeah. I'm making the New York Times mashed potatoes because I, I have never mastered mashed potatoes. I've the never nice thing about the really? thermo mix, I don't know how it does it, but it, 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 uh, it really whips them because it's kind of like a blender in there. And so it, there's never any lumps. It's very creamy. The only problem is it's also sticky. <laughs> They're very, there's a lot, you need a lot of butter to, to, to make it go down. <laughs> Got it. It's good. It's really good. You when you come over, we'll do Thermomix Mania. We'll do it all. It'll be fun. I love it. Yeah. We'll shoot the show from your kitchen yes. with Stacy playing with the Thermomix. Thermomix. <laughs> I'll get my son to come over to chop things really fast. Whoa. It'll be oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be great. Uh actually, you are all gonna get a holiday gift from my son this year. So stay oh, tuned. My. Yes. He's got a new product Is it line. Salty. It's a little salty. Yes, salt, <laughs> Hank, salt. He already has it? How, how quickly did he do that? I, the, the speed with which this is all happening is kind Good of mind-boggling. Um, now, shouldn't, shouldn't Sam Lesson invest in him? Yeah, did you pitch Salt I, Hank to I, Sam Lesson? I, I, I'm staying out of it. He's already signed a deal with DBA. They're managing oh, right. his uh, sales. Um, he's got this salt, this salt deal. <laughs> Do you want, you, you got to see his logo. It's the cutest thing. Let me see if I can find it here. I don't know if I, I it's on my phone, so I don't know if I can, um, blow it up enough for you to see it. But I told him he's the next chef Boyardee. There's, <laughs> there's salt, Ooh. there's salt Ooh. Hank's logo for the salt Hank. Oh, nice. Yeah. Essential flaky. Oh, sea wow. Salt. That's so great. There's the. Calabrian pesto. Ooh. There's the oh yeah. Ooh. There's a truffle salt in here. There it is. Uh, it's gonna be good. 
It's going to be wow. good. It's truffle it's and good. garlic. Ugh. And all of yeah. it featuring... <laughs> Salt Hank. Salt Hank. <laughs> I just where like, did where did where did the moniker come from? What why why is I have no, well he used to be sodium deficiency, which wasn't the catchiest <laughs> name ever. So. That's like a that's like a band name. I know. Yeah. You know, this is what I love about it. It it's it's all been unconscious and just, you know, doing what he really yeah. loves. And it's somehow kind of magically manifested. Twit was like that too in the early days. It just kind of all came together. And it, uh, you know, sometimes if you do something <clears throat> you're really passionate about it and it's going and it's just like you're doing what you love it the universe gets together it's and, a beautiful thing and it's a helps beautiful you thing. out yeah cause so. for thanksgiving <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. so you want to end the show leo oh i probably should wind this show up thank you everybody <laughs> john wants to go home have a wonderful thanksgiving we'll see you next week or actually i'll see you on saturday and we'll see you all next week on this week in google bye bye <laughs> Hey, you don't have to wait till the weekend to get the tech news you need. Join Jason Howell and myself, Micah Sargent, for Tech News Weekly, where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news.